Good afternoon, everyone. I hope, uh, hope it was a good, a good, a short, short break there. Uh, thanks for staying and sort of until the uh, until the last session this afternoon. Um, so we've got a few a few more speakers lined up uh, for this for this session. Uh, the first one um, this afternoon is going to be Zubair um, Sulaiman. Um, Zubair, if you're there, if you can uh, un unmute yourself and, and maybe get get ready to to share your uh, uh, presentation. Um, Zubair is a is a senior uh, engineering technician at Drakenstein Municipality, so that's Paul in in the Western Cape. Uh, he's with the planning and design section in the water services department. He's got a national diploma in civil engineering and a BTEC in civil engineering. Uh, and his talk this afternoon will, uh, will provide an overview of the uh, water conservation, water demand management initiatives in Drakenstein. And uh, I think one of the, one of the interesting things which, uh, which Zubair may touch on are the, are the PRV chambers that they use in Drakenstein. Um, I think it's, it's, uh, it's one of the few municipalities that I'm aware of that's using stainless steel, uh, you know, for the entire uh, PRV installation. And the other thing that's quite interesting is the security measures for the, for the PRV chamber. So maybe it's a bear, if there is a chance, if you, if you are able to share with us how, uh, how you are securing PRV chambers um, in, in Drakenstein municipality. Um, Zubair, so thank you very much and uh, uh, welcome to now uh, continue. Uh, as Niels mentioned, uh, my name is Zubair Suleiman. I'm from Drakenstein municipality and I'll be presenting to you on our ongoing efforts to reduce non-revenue water within Drakenstein municipality. Okay, so let's get started. So the outline of the presentation will basically cover the locality of Drakenstein, an overview of our water services department and our water supply sources, current water demand and a chat about uh, our current statistics, what uh, water conservation and demand management entails, uh, or what uh, initiatives we've been take, we, 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 are, we have put in place, our succession, our successes and challenges, and uh, conclusion. So Drakensen municipality is situated in the Western Cape within the Cape Winelands district. We are centrally located with, uh, between the boundaries of the city of Cape Town municipality, Stellenbosch and Witsenburg municipality. Um, as you can see here, this is just a map showing where we situated, smack bang in the middle. Okay, so a little bit about our water services supply scheme. Um, the areas include Paul, Wellington, Swandium, Sauron, Herman, and Hoda. As a population of about 21,000 people or 71,600 households, um, we have an average annual daily demand of 13,974 megalitres per annum, 877 kilometres of pipeline ranging from 50 to 1,000 millimetre diameters, a total of 28 service reservoirs with capacities of 0.8 megalitres to 100 megalitres, the biggest being our Lady Fontaine um, Reservoir, uh, 20 booster pump stations, and the service area of roughly 121 kilometers, expanding from uh, square, kilometer squared, expanding from Simondium to Sauron. The water demand for Drakenstein is mainly met by, uh, supplied by the um, Vemmerzoek Dam, which supplies plus minus 90% of treated water to our reservoirs. We have our own, in the past, we have implemented uh, schemes to reduce the dependency on the Cape Town City of Cape Town's water supply system, which include the Mielwater water treatment work, which supplies around about 15% of Paul's water supply. Recently, we've also um, constructed the Valve and Pass water treatment works in Wellington. Um, it's a 10 megalitre treatment plant, uh, which is in operation. It's water from the Witworth, the dams. And Hood and Hermon are dependent on the full flay dam controlled by the city of Cape Town, while Hermon, Bainscroft, and Sauron's potable water comes from the Witte and New River. This is just an overview to show you some images of our 
Nanty's Dam situated at the back of Paul Rock. Um, the water gets fed through uh, pipelines to our meal water treatment works. The quality of the water is generally good, undergoes a rapid sand filtration and uh, disinfection process. And, uh, it's one of the treatment plants that we are quite proud of uh, as that we incorporated into the natural environment to make it aesthetically pleasing and environmentally, uh, environmentally friendly as possible. Next one here is the recently completed Valve and Pass 10 megaliter per day water treatment plant and outbuildings. Um, yeah. Part of our efforts to reduce dependency on the city of Cape Town water supply, uh, we've also um, established boil treatment plants, two plants uh, situated at the boil low treatment plant, as well as the um, sport, sport treatment plant. Boil low treatment plant is capable of producing five megaliters per day, Paris about 1.6 megaliters per day. Both package plants. Uh, were part of the drought initiative, uh, which uh, occurred during the 2015-16 uh, financial year. And uh, the plants provide purified water directly to the adjacent uh, reticulation networks. Um, it's, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, it's implemented as part of the uh, drought beef programs. A bit about water demand statistics for this presentation, we'll be focusing solely on uh, the Paul and Wellington demand area um, due to uh, being our greatest challenge and our greatest demand. So from the chart that you see over here, the green bars represent the actual demand. The brownish line that you see, the horizontal line, it's just above the 35,000 megaliter um, line on the side or indicator on the side is the allocations that we have. And uh, the curved graph represents our uh, predicted future demand. Now we've taken our base year 2020 and in in included 25% um, to, uh, to, to make provision for the bounce back, if you can call it that, uh, as part of the um, demand reduction uh, during the drought period from 2015. Uh, it would probably take about six to eight years for us to get to that level of uh, consumption again. Um, and the, yeah, as you can see, the curved green dotted dashed line represents a 4% annual growth. The red dashed line represents a 2% 2, 2 annual growth. And the blue line represents the projected requirement from the water services development plan. Um, so if you have a look, at, if you have a look, uh, you'll see where it intersects with a 4% annual growth. By 2041, we'll meet our allocation versus demand requirements. And uh, yeah, so as it stands now, we're looking okay for the next few years, but we are implementing practices and uh, plans so that we can cater for future needs, despite um, the uh, graph that shows we are still okay with the um, upcoming years. Okay, uh, to get started, non-revenue water. So as you all know, Non-revenue water consists of the items listed in red and yellow. So we're going to be focused on a number of initiatives to attend to these, um, to these uh, components that make up non-revenue water, which consists of unbuilt metered consumption, unbuilt unmetered consumption, unauthorized consumption, consumer metering accuracies, leakage, leakages, storage leakages, and service connection, service connection leakages up to the meter. Okay. I've been, uh, this uh, slide is uh, going to come under a bit of scrutiny as um, Ron has mentioned that percentages are deceiving, but we'll address this a bit later on um, to show the actual system volume input and the savings uh, as well as our actual demand. So between the years of 1989 and 1999, Arkansas municipality experienced an average water demand growth of 3.5%. Non-revenue water was unacceptably high, which was in excess of 33%. Um, and prices in low-laying areas were unacceptably high, which was in nine, in the nine bar area and, and, and plus. 
As part of uh, the water demand management or water conservation management interventions, we've incorporated a number of, of activities or practices. This includes hydraulic modeling, rising blocking tariff infrastructures, increased public awareness programs, metering of all unmetered connections, promotion of water saving devices, refurbishment and replacement of network infrastructure, leak repair, pressure management, and also proper water services planning, including, including your water services development, development plan, your master plans, your annual water services reports, and so forth. So let's just get started on the first slide. Okay, as you can see here, yeah, um, the promotion of quality uh, fittings um, is key to our uh, reduction in non-revenue water as it reduces leakages. First image that you see on top, that represents a uh, pump station chamber and the level control chamber, sorry, of uh, the 11 megaliter Newton reservoir that was constructed in 2016, 2017 financial year. Um, as you can see, as Neil mentioned, um, the stainless steel components, um, we specify we, we specify stainless steel three or four components for uh, piping inside chambers. Um, and uh, yeah, the picture just below it with a pipeline represents um, the, our grade of HDPE pipelines that we uh, specify within the Drakens municipal area. Um, as part of our standards, we've incorporated it to uh, specify that pipelines should be PN 12.5, PE 100, HDPE pipelines. We also specify these are brass components, and this all um, comes as part of initiatives to reduce um, to reduce leakages and possible corrosion and pitting losses, uh, water losses due to corrosion and pitting. Um, initially, it is a bit more pricey than using a lower quality item. However, your return uh, will be seen uh, in terms of callbacks. So, if you have if the use of quality fitting is very important uh, to prevent any callbacks, uh, because it might seem a bit expensive initially, but to have a callback, you only you're going to have um, labor costs, excavation, labor materials, premix costs. So it's worth your while to invest in, or worth our while to invest in proper quality fittings and materials and to make sure that uh, it is incorporated into our standards. So any developments that happen in Drakenstein, um, the plans get scrutinized by our technical staff and all materials are approved by technical staff in senior positions uh, so that everything is uniform. Another important factor Take into consideration uh, that we, we, we are strict on is our flange drillings. Um, up to 250 millimeter diameter, we focus on table D, BS10 drillings, uh, schedule 10 thickness. Uh, anything above that, table 1600D, this also uh, assists with our maintenance teams so that if anything needs to be done and changes need to be made, we don't sit with a situation where the wrong fitting or the wrong um, flange is brought to site um yeah so it's just uh, nice nice to have everything uniform um yeah we pride ourselves on the on the fittings and materials that we specify public awareness programs okay so we have had another a number of initiatives over the years on the top left hand side you can see uh, the posters that uh, have been made available in the communities and schools to give um the younger generation and the public in general, an idea of why it is important to save water. And uh, yeah, and also give them an understanding of where the treated water comes from. <laughs> Magically appear out of a tap. It has to go through all process, which you can see on the top right hand corner. Mr. Daniel Aru over there with uh, school kids. Um, he's at the Melwater Water Treatment Works. Um, and at the bottom, Mr. Ian Enning is taking a uh, few of uh, stu the students through the treatment works. So it's a nice uh, initiative that we take to show students where the raw water comes from, how it is treated, and all the efforts and uh, means that it takes to get to a tap on the bottom, which hopefully gives them a better understanding and appreciation for the water that comes out of the taps at home and will encourage them to be water wise and safe. Um, you can see in the bottom left-hand corner over there um, the poster. 
Uh, so this is also an initiative that uh, Drakenstein had uh, during the Water Week, where um, students are encouraged to uh, create posters and submit it where they get prizes. Um, and this also forces them to do some research and really think about um, where the water comes from, how it is treated, why you should save, all of these things. Okay, this is just a slide to show you the pamphlets and the leaflets that we make available. Um, on your right hand side, uh, it's just the water wise saving tips and you also inform the public through the mail with these pamphlets and leaflets. So they are uh, aware of what's going on, the quality of water, what they can do to assist in battling uh, against leakages or uh, waste usage. Um, metering of all unmetered connections, including parks, gardens, public open, public open spaces. So in Drakenstein, we specify the use of class C meters for all domestic connections and bulk meters for high and low flow uh, class B. Um, this is an important uh, factor in patterning non-revenue water, get, getting all uh, meters connections uh, 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 If it's a continuously made to meter all unmetered connections, including old fire water connections. Uh, in order to reduce wastage, we also limit the size as part of our standards on domestic connections, uh, which is up to 20 mil, at uh, 20, uh, 20 mil. And anything above that for commercial use, the size of a connection will also depend on the available infrastructure within the area that can be um, analyzed through hydraulic modeling, uh, which, which demand will be allowed for a specific development or a specific uh, renovated property. Um, to touch on, among other things, Ravensen Municipality has also delved into smart meters or prepaid meters um, as part of the 2018-2019 financial year. We've uh, tested the option of using prepaid meters as a measure of uh, obtaining revenue for water. Uh, we've tested 63 sites and found that it didn't work. Uh, it might work in other areas, but for us, uh, it wasn't a success. Uh, mainly due to product failure rate uh, and unreliability. So we've decided to abandon uh, the large scale implementation of um, during the 2018-19 financial year. Refurbishment of the existing pipelines and infrastructure. Okay, this is an important factor that we, we, we pride ourselves in the Drakens municipality. Um, it's important during this process, not to only refer, but select the right process of refurbishing uh, your infrastructure. The pipeline replacement preferred method that we would like to have all our pipelines replaced with, replaced with is the pipe cracking. All of our projects are handled in-house from tender stage to uh, contract appointment stakes, project management, design, as built designs, everything is done in-house. On the picture on your left, you can see um, why we prefer this method An existing route was, is followed for the pipeline to be replaced. And you can see all of the connections and service connections intersecting the trench. So if we were to do it via open trenching, you're more than likely to hit one of those services, but through cracking methods, you avoid all of that trouble, if I may put it that way. And um, it's, a, it's also more cost effective. However, this isn't always possible. You have to look at other methods as well to produce the best quality product and to maintain or to get the longest lifespan out of your newly installed infrastructure. Um, this includes uh, uh, open trenching methods, for example, uh, but it does have a high, uh, high impact on your uh, cost, um, premix costs, mainly uh, labor costs, uh, hard rock, those type of things that add all add up to the pro project's uh, expenses and challenges. Um, however, if uh, before we, we decide to go on a, a, a method of replacement, we'll also uh, establish the depth of the pipeline to ensure that we get the correct cover um, because it's, uh, we need to protect the newly installed infrastructure to make sure that we get the longest lifespan out of it. You can see in the middle photo over here, we just have one of our plumbers uh, doing an installation into the main lines on a AC pipeline. All of our cuttings to the main lines to reduce the um, to reduce the risk to the contractor and also to ensure that the quality at the connection is maintained uh, and done properly. Uh, our own internal staff, uh, plumbers, handle the connections 
as you can see there, any connection to an AC pipe will be done via stainless steel flanged uh, T pieces or adapters. Uh, if you have a look over here at the connection between the flange adapter and the AC pipe, we always uh, we, we promote the use of the flange adapter uh, instead of going with plain in its stainless steel uh, T pieces to prevent that slippage between the joints. Okay, moving on. Repair, leak repair and maintenance. Okay, so what you see here in slide one uh, is an old 250 millimeter diameter um, so a valve. Uh, what happened here was we've, we've seen surf, uh, pipeline water rising uh, above the ground and uh, immediately noted that there was a leakage at the valve. So we opened up, it's about 2.5 meters deep. Um, to decide on uh, whether we're going to replace the valve or uh, pack it. So what we decided on, in order to prevent the leakage losses, uh, we'll pack it and have a look to see um, what uh, whether the valves are still functional. And uh, because it might be, this again comes down to selecting the correct um, process for, for, for um, repairing, either replace or, or repair. In this case, repairing was the right option. So the process basically involved um, the use of shoring in order to make the trench safe. It's about two meters deep. We also um, uh, removed the, the gland nut, uh, replaced, removed the old packing, replaced the T-bolts. And as you can see in the third slide, the leakage stopped. So from there, we could work nicely, rebuild the chamber, include new stainless steel extension pieces, and um, yeah, basically stopped the leak. We had four of these in Bartholomew Street, and fortunately, all of them uh, were functional um, and the leakage stopped. Um, hydraulic modeling. So hydraulic modeling in Drakenstein is a, is a technique we use to identify areas with high pressure. Uh, it assists in creating discrete zones. Real-time data logging is used monitor the zones and pick up any unauthorized zone valve operation they compromise the pressure management and water conservation this is also something we use uh, before any major development comes up uh, we don't do the hydraulic modeling in-house uh, we leave that to the guys uh, that live eat and breathe um, these type of things and they assist us uh, with establishing uh, where our risk areas are any new development that comes in would have to do a hydraulic model in order to establish whether the capacity is there to, to accommodate the development and also what upgrades are required so that uh, we can uh, check which master plan items we need to implement and come to an agreement with the developer, um, those type of things. The rising block tariff structure. This, this component was used, uh, is used to um, basically, uh, based off of the more you use, the more you pay. So as you can see, we have ranges between zero to six kiloliters, six to 10 kiloliters, 10 to 15 kiloliters, and, and so forth. Um, yeah, so this uh, initiative was implemented as well uh, in the 1999, 2000, so that we can uh, increase public awareness on the amount of water usage that they are using uh, because as soon as you tap into um, the, the, the consumers' uh, uh, rates that they're paying for the, for the services, they then soon realize um, what, how much they're actually using, how much they're actually wasting, and those type of things. So it's proven to be very effective. And uh, yeah. Pressure management. So it's been reiterated throughout this program many, many times the importance of pressure management. And we at Drakenstein uh, Municipality, um, we've pride ourselves in, in, in uh, well, we've come with pressure management. Um, so basically, Paul consists of 10 PRV zones, Wellington two PRV zones, a majority of them consist of uh, single feed supply into these zones. Um, these zones are monitored uh, using online systems in order to establish the uh, downstream, upstream, and critical point, as well as the flows, so that we can uh, troubleshoot uh, if necessary. I'm going to take you through one of our more recent installations um, that we've done. Uh, 
Um, what you see on the image here is uh, the runway uh, PRV installation. So we've had the privilege of working with uh, Mr. Neil Mayer from uh, WRP, who's uh, guided us uh, in this project to uh, establish sizing of the PRVs and also which PRVs uh, would work best. In this case, we are sitting with a 80 millimeter diameter setup uh, for the proportional reducing PRV to reduce the incoming uh, pressure ratio. And then we have a, a pilot control PRV uh, that adjusts the, 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 the flow uh, after it's into the proportional reducing valve. We also have a 25 millimeter bypass. Um, the reason why we've implemented 80 millimeters components, you'll see it looks very strange with the 200 millimeter diameter valves. So if you have a look on the master plan of a snippet of our master plan over here, you'll see that uh, the runway PRV is a uh, consist is item DPW423. So the southern, in recent years, we've experienced a high increase in uh, development within Paul or increase for housing in uh, demand for housing and uh, private developments. So this entire southern corridor over here uh, is currently underway with development, uh, which would require higher water demand. So in the interim, while development is still taking place, we've inserted the 80 millimeter diameter components. Um, this will make provision for controlling the, the, the downstream pressures. Um, and then when the time is right or the demand reaches its um, required, required amount, um, we will then interchange this uh, whole setup by just unscrewing the valves, uh, the, the valves, the uh, nuts and bolts, removing it completely and installing the 200 millimeter diameter setup um, that was that's proposed for the long term. So you'll see we've made enough space here for the um, components to be removed and, and placed in again. This was quite an uh, enjoyable project for us. Uh, we, as I've mentioned, Neil assisted us with the um, design report uh, in establishing which are the important factors to look at and uh, gave us as technical staff uh, the chance to uh, implement our design skills and uh, project manage the, the process uh, from uh, uh, steel uh, from designing the steel components all the way through to reinforcing design, project management, and also um, learning lessons along the way. And uh, yeah. Okay, so another example of what we've done was uh, of a PRV installation that we've done as of recent is the creation of the Amstelop zone. Um, as I've mentioned previously, uh, most of our zones consist of a single feed. So the green shaded area that you see over there is the newly formed Amstelhof zone. So firstly, what we had to do was isolate the zone completely uh, and do a zero pressure test to ensure that the zone is discrete. We have a single feed into the system on the Amstelhof pump station uh, where after the PRV was, was installed. Uh, so once again, Neil assisted us with the sizing. And we took it from there and uh, did the installation part uh, and also the project management part. Uh, the, the setup here consists of a 150 millimeter diameter uh, PRV, which is pilot control with 40 millimeter bypass. Um, yeah. Uh, pressure and flow loggers are inserted at our critical points. This is important to monitor whether the, uh, the consumers are obtaining proper pressure. Um, we've uh, set the PRVs um, and uh, we can in remotely uh, what, the crit what the effect is at the critical points. And uh, we also insert these at other important points, low points as well, uh, to make sure that we can gain valuable data so that we may manage the system better. So as you can see over here, um, this is the results on top of here. This, this graph is the result of the installation of the Amstel of PRV. Um, so you can immediately see the dropping pressure downstream uh, after we've, we've set it. So it was, it was at about uh, 5.3 bars and we've lowered it to three bars uh, downstream. And that uh, assisted us in, in, in a lot of things within the zone. Um, yeah, we are still to install the logger 
permanent at the critical point. Uh, we're just waiting on the contracts to be in place and then we'll finish up that one. At the bottom over here, you'll see the Zandvik PRV. Um, the top line represents the, um, sorry. Okay, so the top line represents the upstream uh, pressure. The uh, blue line represents the downstream pressure. And the red line that you see over there represents the uh, critical point pressure. Uh, so you can see the effectiveness of the pressure reduction uh, through the use of PRVs, which ultimately reduces your leakage losses and uh, your non-revenue water. The telemetry system, this is an important uh, system in uh, the early 2000s. Uh, it's upgraded and improved a lot since then. All reservoirs, dams, bulk meters, and pressures are monitored continuously and alarms are sent out to the maintenance teams for immediate reaction. So this assists us in reacting to any losses that may occur at our treatment plants and reservoirs that are overflowing and those type of things. The information is, kept, information is kept on a municipal server and can be recalled at any given time. This is crucial in uh, monitoring and maintaining your system and learning from historical faults. Uh, information is updated every 20 seconds. It also allows us to uh, monitor the flow patterns and we can investigate or troubleshoot um, deeper uh, into what's going on in our reservoirs, our pumps, and our systems. Um, burst pipes can also be traced earlier. Um, so now one of the benefits, another benefit of using the telemetry system. And uh, yeah, all senior staff members within the municipality have access to this, um, this system. Okay, and uh, results and successes. So as part of uh, our, I'm referring back to our percentages of our non-revenue water. Um, we, we, to, to really evaluate our, our processes of leakage and non-revenue water management, the infrastructure leakage index uh, is used. And uh, you'll see at the bottom the different categories A through to D. Uh, basically, if it's blue, it means uh, we, are, we are good to go. Uh, so you'll see in the 2021 financial year, we have the ILI set at below two, except for um, except for in Erman. Um, yeah. Theoretical savings in volume is part of the successes that we've seen. Um, you'll notice that uh, we've by we, we, we this chart basically represents um, the actual demand, the savings, and theoretical demand. Basically, to take you through it. The savings, uh, the, the theoretical demand is represented by the, the orange bars. Uh, we've taken a 3.5% from the previous base year. Uh, the blue bars represent the actual demand uh, with, uh, with the um, gray bars representing the savings, actual savings. Um, so you'll see uh, at about 2015, now it takes a dip and slowly rises due to the easing of the water restrictions. In total, um, savings is about uh, 224,000 megaliters to date. Um, again, this is theoretical based off of a 3.5% um, uh, annual growth. Um, yeah. Some challenges that uh, we face uh, during uh, through revenue water initiatives and programs is uh, choosing and isolating the different pressure zones keeping these zones isolated. Um, we always have uh, one or two cases where um, a zone valve is opened up that causes havoc within the system, pressures resulting in burst pipes and water losses. Uh, we are, we are, we'll touch on how we plan on um, addressing this. Theft. Um, during the recent uh, pandemic, we've seen an increase in theft of uh, specifically water meters and cover and frames, these type of things. Uh, we've seen uh, our infrastructure uh, being damaged, but we have um, methods and things put in place so that we can address this. Uh, funding is another challenge. Um, with a decrease in funds uh, for capital projects on non-revenue water, um, it does uh, make it a bit difficult to reach our targets. Uh, however, uh, we are seeing a bigger buy-in from council to assist us with this. Um, we've touched on vandalism of infrastructure. 
basically it's all around um, from our reservoirs uh, that we have to secure all the way through to our PRVs, we have to put infrastructure or, or uh, security measures, measures in place so that we protect what we do because we invest a lot of, of, of our funds and money into these uh, uh, components. So um, we'll just uh, touch on that a bit in, in a bit and now we, we look after the, the infrastructure. Zubair? Zubair? Yes. Sorry to, to interrupt there. Can you, can you aim to maybe wrap up sort of in the next uh, five minutes? Can you try to just speed up a bit there? We just want to stay as close as possible to our program. If you, if you can maybe just speed up to, to sort of to get to the uh, final slide. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no problem. I'm, I'm nearly done. Okay. Okay. Then another problem that or challenges that is faced isn't specifically addressed to Drakensen, but overall is a selection and recruitment of correct technical staff members and retaining them. Uh, the skills are out there. It's just about selecting the correct persons to manage and uh, maintain your system. Institutional knowledge lost. That is being referred to, uh, for example, if a plumber were to work fast for 20 years and he were to retire, uh, the time that it takes for a new plumber to build up that knowledge to, again, um, manage the system in the way that uh, the, the retired one did or well, is problematic. And uh, it is a challenge that uh, many municipalities face. Local content, um, this has been uh, a challenge for us in the sense that um, contractors generally struggle with pricing these things. Uh, and it makes it difficult for us to maintain and um, get our quality fittings and products, as we mentioned earlier. Um, just another slide, um, Curtis, you're my colleague. Um, we do do, uh, in order to, to reduce leakages on the consumer's end, we do in uh, 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 top 100 um, inspections on top 100 consumers. And this uh, is just an image to show uh, that the system was replaced. After that, uh, when we came to do the final inspection, uh, the system was then uh, replaced or sold and replaced with a big buck. It's a big buck for whoever stayed there and uh, yeah, it doesn't solve our problem. Um, as part of our security measures, we have the interaction system that we put in place uh, in all of our chambers um, so that it prevents theft. Um, yeah, we've ran into this a couple of times into our depots and uh, <laughs> You can see that on the right hand side, the Calvin frames is electronically activated. And this uh, is what we're going to be using in order to um, prevent unauthorized access into our chambers and to make persons accountable for changes onto the PRVs, uh, which will be electronically logged uh, and available online. Those were future water demand interventions, um, automatic meter reading to eliminate metering inaccuracies. A continuation implementation of internal indigenous leakage repairs. We have a few PRVs that we would like to install and two more zones. Uh, continuation, continuation of preventative maintenance and our repair program and uh, on-site investigations, which is uh, from um, high level to uh, on the ground staff. We all uh, promote being hands on and checking um, on site uh, what's going on and uh, reporting to conclude, uh, to sustain the water demand management efforts made by Drakenstein, the following strategy was followed. We have a proper report of all our data, training of personnel and transfer of knowledge to technical staff using equipment for all day-to-day -day operations, refurbishment of the reticulation, research on, on new products and materials to improve the system, preventative maintenance programs, and reduce burst pipe repair times. And lastly, to keep it basic, not necessary to um, overcomplicate things or to um, uh, basically reinvent the wheel. You can improve on it, but uh, keep it basic, stick to the basics, improve on what, what, what uh, we've just mentioned, and uh, we should be okay for the, for the upcoming future. Uh, that's that. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, uh, for that presentation. Sorry I had to sort of uh, ask you sort of to speed up uh, sort of a bit there. We'll, we'll sort of get uh, back to you then sort of uh, in, the, in, in the panel discussion sort of to ask you to ask you some questions. So thank you very much for that, uh, for that presentation. And uh, yeah, I see there are some, some questions coming on, on, on um, how Drakenstein is, is sort of handling the security. 
uh, so uh, and, and the theft of, of fittings, etc. So we'll, we'll definitely like to to ask you a few more questions in the in the last session. Um, if I can, if I can ask the uh, the next speaker sort of to then to then come up, uh, Samantha Steli. Um, so Samantha is an environmental scientist at Rand Water. Uh, she's got more than thirteen years experience in the in the water industry. She's got an MSc in Environment, Ecology and Conservation at WITS and another MSc in uh, Aquatic Health uh, from, uh, from um, UJ. She's a member of WISA, of IWA and the South African Society of Aquatic Scientists. I didn't know that there sort of was such a, um, a society, so that's good. And at Rand Water, she coordinates a team of researchers and environmental education trainers um, at, uh, at Rand Water. Um, so, and her presentation this afternoon is going to provide an overview of the, of the uh, sort of the water situation in South Africa and, uh, and what Rand Water is doing to, to inform consumers about, uh, about the need for, for water conservation. So Samantha, with that, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your time this afternoon. And we look forward to your presentation. Uh, I see you've got uh, a few um, sort of uh, questions for the audience. So Samantha, you can take it over now. You can, you can guide um, the audience through the questions. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much, Neil. Uh, just can you confirm that you are seeing my slide presentation and you can hear me clearly? We can see you and we can hear you clearly and the presentation is clear. So you are- Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so I've got a few questions here. Uh, before I start the presentation, um, I'd like it if you could uh, have a look at what I've put up and um, give me your answers. And then I'm not sure if I'll be able to see those before we start the presentation. Yes, Samantha. So you can okay. you can basically give it sort of a, a few moments, and then at the moment you you ask um, the IT guys to show the results, and it will appear on the screen in the same manner 100%. as the questions appear now. So so you can 100%. maybe give a moment, and the moment you you ask for the results, it can appear on the screen. Great, thanks, Neil. Okay, so if I could ask you to have a look at the questions I've asked, um, and then just put in your answers. Uh, while we're doing that, I'm just going to, um, again, introduce myself. I'm Samantha Steli. I'm from Randwater, the Environmental Management Services Department, and I head up the WaterWise and Research section. And we focus on uh, environmental and water conservation education campaigns and training. And to back that up, we do quite a bit of uh, water and environmental conservation research. Um, so as Neil mentioned, uh, I'm going to, I think, cap off the presentations that we've had over the past few days, uh, just talking through South Africa's water situation. Um, I think everybody here should be aware of where we stand, but it's nice to just get an overview of what's happening in the country and just um, emphasize the need to conserve water. So if I could see the results of that poll, um, okay, 100%. So um, the majority of you do think South Africa is a water scarce country. Um, I'd love to know that 9% that said no, uh, why you say that. Um, so if uh, you're happy to put something in the comments, I'd love to understand why you don't think we are a water scarce country. Uh, in terms of the biggest water user, I see that um, it's quite a varied response. I'll get to the answer to that question a little bit into my presentation but it seems like the majority of people um, are stating that agriculture and irrigation um, is the biggest sector in South Africa in terms of water use. Um, how much water do you think the average person in the country uses? The majority of you say between 150 to 200 liters per day, um, close on the mark. And, uh, I'm very happy to see that 96% of you know how to read your water meter. You'll be surprised that when we speak to the public, a large majority of people, I think the latest um, surveys we did was about 65 to 70% of the general public don't know how to read their water meters. 
And again, 92% of you understand your means for water statement, which is fantastic. And I think we've obviously got a captive audience here, um, but it's just good to understand where, you, where you're sitting. And uh, again, in terms of that, our surveys have shown that about um, 55 to 65% of people don't understand um, their, their municipal bill. They don't know what uh, the, the information details. So that's something that we're working on as a team. Okay, great, thank you very much. I'm going to get started um, on my presentation. Um, okay, great, so you should be seeing the second slide here. Uh, this is something that I think you've all uh, seen, you're all familiar with, but again, it's just a really nice graphical representation on the water that's available on earth for human consumption. And I'm not going to go into depth into this, but um, it was something, I think it was Bambos that mentioned earlier, the interest shown or the need to look at alternative sources of water. And I'm going to go a little bit into that, um, give an idea what the country is looking at. Um, but I think it's very important that we understand how little fresh water we have or how little water we actually have for human consumption. It's, um, the, the basis of why we all are uh, here this afternoon. So in answer to one of the poll questions, uh, the majority of you were correct. The biggest user of water in the country is the agricultural sector. Uh, you can see that there are seven major sectors, um, but yeah, over 60% of our available water goes to agriculture and irrigation. After that, we've got 30% of water in South Africa going to urban and rural use, which is including domestic use. And that obviously then applies very much to, to where we're sitting at the moment, and especially for Rand Water. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with who Rand Water is, we are the largest um, supply of bulk potable water um, in Africa. Uh, we supply to the Gauteng province mainly, but also to parts of Mpumalanga and the, the Free State and um, the Northwest province. So um, water demand, especially from a, a domestic uh, sector, is very important for us. Our current water situation, this graph uh, is quite uh, interesting. You can see that... Um, the, the uh, water use um, or availability per person in selected countries. And you can see South Africa on the bottom left-hand side there, but we are uh, officially classified as a water scarce country. So uh, to all of those of you who, who answered yes to South Africa being water scarce, that is our official classification. And it's defined as the volumetric abundance or lack of water expressed as the ratio between uh, human uh, water consumption and the available water supply in a given area. It's measured over time and across uh, regions. And it's based largely on climatic conditions in a country and uh, water demand. So water scarcity, uh, scarcity is a simple definition means that there is not enough water to meet all the demands coming from a specific region. And um, our water scarcity is specifically driven by an ever increasing demand uh, for water, as well as our climate. I'm sure you're all aware of um, the, the semi-arid uh, climate that we live in. We also have a very varied um, spatial and temporal variability of rainfall across the region. So that means that our rainfall is not evenly distributed throughout the year or across the country. And you'll be aware of that when you um, you see that the west of the country uh, often has water shortages um, and it's a lot drier than the east of the country. So what does this mean for the future and specifically for, for our country? Our uh, average rate of potential evaporation is three times that of the rainfall that we receive, which basically means a lot of the, the precipitation we receive is then removed uh, through evaporation. Only 9% of the rainfall we get ends up as runoff, and the runoff water is then what's channeled into our rivers and streams, and then uh, into our dams where we abstract the water. 98% of our country's water is already allocated, and we are expecting a shortfall of almost 3 billion cubic meters. This is a, a very nice map that shows the gap between the existing supply and the projected demand in 2030. So as you can see in the upper bowl, um, that is where uh, Gateng, most of Gateng's water comes from. 
uh, there is a severe gap between the existing supply and the projected demand. And um, because of that spatial temporal variability in precipitation across the country that I mentioned in the previous slide, we, uh, we need to, to look at water storage, which we do, um, to ensure a, a continuous water supply. Um, but again, that's not the, the only thing that we should rely on. Um, and these alternative water sources are, very, are becoming very important for us to consider. Uh, because we're water scarce, I'm not going to go too much into the slide because all the engineers here will be very familiar with the large and extensive network of um, infrastructure that we have across the country to supply potable water. Uh, we've also got uh, a lot of um, transfer schemes and water coming in from other countries. Um, so besides the, the natural um, ecological infrastructure that uh, we focus on in our environmental research, we've got our engineered man-made infrastructure as well. Uh, this slide is very text intensive, I know that, but um, for me, it's an important one because there are some very um, scary facts that we, we need to be aware of here. And these were taken from the National Water and Sanitation Master Plan. It was published around two years ago. Um, and it's a plan that was developed by the Department of Water and Sanitation. And um, I just want you to take a second or two to have a look through these, these facts. And something um, that I think will resonate a lot with people in this convention is um, the fact that stating 41% of municipal water does not generate revenue and 35% of water is lost through leaks. Um, we've uh, got a lot of water and um, that uh, then translates to, to rand per year that is being lost um, with our municipalities. So um, interesting but scary facts. But yeah, we know South Africa is semi-arid. We've got a highly variable climate constrained water resources that are increasingly under pressure from urban development, increase in population, uh, power supply, mining, and then destruction of um, ecological uh, infrastructure as well. But we know uh, that these uh, problems are going to be exacerbated by climate change, and we're already seeing those effects in our country. Um, the long-term climate change predictions in this country is for an increasingly drier western half of the country and um, a lot more variability in the weather patterns that we expect um, to experience. And something that I think we've seen in the past few years is more extreme weather events. And I'm talking here about the droughts and the floods that we have experienced in the past. We are expected to have an increase in average temperatures and there, as I mentioned earlier, an increase in losses through evaporation. Um, so scary things to come, and it's uh, the sorts of things that we all need to be prepared for and start planning for as soon as possible. Um, this is the Long-Term Adaptation Scenarios flagship research program for South Africa, and it shows the, the number of adaptation scenarios that have been developed in response to the South African National Climate Change uh, Response White Paper. These are climate trends and project projections um, at a national scale. And you can see that the country is divided, divided up into six hydrological zones. And um, you can describe these scenarios or these predict predictions using four main climate scenarios with different uh, degrees of change. Um, and this captures the impact of global mitigation over time. So you can see that table below the, the map of the country uh, indicates rainfall projections for each of those six hydrological zones throughout the country. And then the international mitigation responses and how those would affect the likelihood of these scenarios. Overall, like I said, we can experience, expect to experience a higher frequency of flooding and drought, um, something our infrastructure also needs to take into account. But um, yeah, a lot of negative uh, information here. But um, there is also a lot happening in our country. And I think it's good that we're aware um, that even though we've got these um, water issues, that the country is doing something to prepare for the future. So going on to alternative water sources, um, this is something that our country is uh, seriously starting to look into. 
And the options that we have include looking at accessing groundwater, desalination, uh, reusing treated wastewater, and then rainfall um, or rainwater harvesting. Here you can see the predicted results of water resource planning strategies to ensure uh, water security in the country. In the mid and the long term, you can see uh, the mid term would be uh, 2025 and the long term is going up to 2040. And the way this graph was developed was by forecasting future water requirements of our country and then overlaying any potential interventions which include water conservation and water demand management operations, as well as drought management, groundwater schemes, um, and various catchment support activities, such as looking after our ecological infrastructure. This also includes rainfall harvesting and water quality monitoring. And uh, the idea here to ensure that the future water demands in the country are met is to create a mix um, of water resources using these, um, we call them unconventional water sources, as well as the, the conventional water sources that we are currently focusing on. Groundwater, a lot of work and information um, has been, has been um, submitted and uh, worked on in terms of accessing groundwater. I'm not going to go into what groundwater actually is. I think everyone here should be familiar with the concepts of groundwater, but it is part of our um, hydrological cycle. And I see there's a lot of work going into accessing groundwater to supplement um, surface water supplies. But I think it's important that we remain aware that groundwater is part of the, the water cycle. And if we remove more groundwater from aquifers then can be replenished, Again, we're going to face some uh, water resource issues. Our groundwater use is currently estimated at 3,500 million cubic meters per annum. Um, and realistically, the amount of groundwater that we should access in the country is 4,500 million cubes. Um, at the moment, the groundwater resource um, contributes to about 13% of our country's total water supply. But again, we need to monitor these levels carefully and use them as sparingly as possible. Um, like any natural resource, if we take more than we replace, the resource will run out eventually. This map here um, illustrates the exportation potential of utilizable groundwater sources across the country. Um, and a few years ago, I think it was 2018, the Department of Water and Sanitation implemented a new rule governing um, private boreholes. Um, in fact, they all need to be metered and the amount of groundwater abstracted has to be recorded and submitted to the DWS. Um, although groundwater is, uh, we'll say, um, governed by the DWS, each municipality does have their own bylaws and restrictions on how groundwater can be used and abstracted. So um, it's best to check with local municipalities in terms of all those authorizations and restrictions. Uh, next, um, something that the country has been looking at uh, for quite a few years now is desalination, um, reducing salts in brackish or seawater, and um, the use of uh, reverse osmosis um, to desalinate groundwater, brackish groundwater, has been used in various towns um, and settlements in the Northern Cape specifically and along the coast. But the thought is that this process is going to become a lot more common, especially along coastal areas in South Africa. The problem here is that desalinated water is often two to four times more expensive than other sources of water. Um, but it's been forecasted that up to 10% of our country's urban water supply could come from desalination plants um, in the next nine to 10 years. Here are some examples of desalination plants across the country. Um, it is a very energy intensive process um, and a lot of the energy to run these um, manufacturers and these, these um, operations is generated by coal fire power stations. And we all know that's not great for sustainability and it's also not great for water supply. Um, the other problem is what happens to the, the products, the leftover brine after the desalination process is complete. And generally it's deposited back into the ocean, but it's a very toxic um, concentration that's, 
that's um, sent out into the ocean, and this can have a negative effect on the marine um, environment. Water reuse, something that's been mentioned in previous presentations. This is um, generally the treatment of discharge from wastewater treatment works uh, to a st standard that's um, suitable for use either in industrial processes or even to the level of potable water uh, that can then be fed back into the water distribution system. And this is also known as direct potable resource, reuse, sorry. Um, at, according to the, the WRC, at the moment, South Africa has three of the seven operational DPR uh, reuse plants in the world. And um, currently the indirect reuse of water is estimated to make up 14% of all our available water. Um, there are a lot of uh, options that you can use at a domestic or household level in terms of reusing um, wastewater, and we refer specifically to grey water. And um, those kinds of uh, reuses would be for non-potable activities such as landscape irrigation. Um, I know that in the industry it can be used uh, for power generation and using or reusing wastewater can then uh, lessen the, the impact on um, wastewater uh, infrastructure, but also the demand, reduce the demand for, for potable water, especially for non-potable water uses. Something that we've noticed when we engage with the public, uh, and especially when it comes to uh, wastewater reuse and grey water use, is the public's perception and the acceptance of reusing wastewater. Um, most people are not comfortable hearing that um, wastewater can be put back into potable um, water distribution supplies, even though it already happens. Um, and they're not very happy to, to think about reusing grey water for non-potable uh, non water activities, but this is something that we focus on in our education campaigns. Um, we try and help people to understand that uh, the standards of treating wastewater are so high that sometimes this wastewater can be of even a higher quality than the water that's abstracted from reservoirs to be treated for, for potable water uses. So it's definitely an option to look at. Rainwater harvesting, again, this comes more down to the household and domestic um, water use level. It's something we encourage a lot of our um, customers to implement and a lot of the communities we work with to implement. It's basically the collection and storage of rainwater, um, either for immediate use or uh, for use before the onset of the next rainy season. Um, in our country, rainwater harvesting is growing, especially in rural areas where we don't have um, a very uh, well-functioning municipal system or where the municipal systems are failing. And uh, as I said, this is something we should definitely encourage, especially as a reliable source of water in rural areas. Um, we don't encourage that people use rainwater for potable water uses, unless it's been treated um, to a suitable standard. And there are a number of ways of simply treating rainwater uh, to a standard that can be used in cooking um, or for drinking water. Uh, invasive alien plant removal. Um, this is a way to indirectly reduce um, water loss or water demand. Um, as you, I'm sure, are all aware, invasive alien plants often use a large amount of water and much more than their indigenous counterparts. And um, besides the water loss, we can also experience a lot of loss in biodiversity. Um, research has shown that uh, close to 3% of the mean annual runoff um, in South Africa's precipitation is actually intercepted by invasive alien plants. And um, they can dramatically reduce the available uh, groundwater and surface water resources, um, also having an impact on stream flows and therefore water quality. So if we look at um, extensive programs to remove invasive alien plants, we can actually improve water availability, but also water quality, as well as having a positive effect on um, biodiversity. Um, I think something that I wanted to raise here, and it's something that we try and um, promote in our education campaigns, is just being aware of your country's water um, situation, and your country's climate. And this can help you understand where you stand in terms of water resources and what you can expect in the future. 
And we access these um, climate forecasts quite uh, regularly from the South African Weather Service. And um, they up to date monthly seasonal forecasts available for the country, available for download off the, the SOARS website. And I've given you some examples of the most recent ones that I could find. Um, and these are the annual seasonal precipitation predictions for our spring season, which would be September, October, November, uh, the image on your left, and our early summer season, which is our October, November, December months. And you can see here from these uh, maps that we can experience above normal rainfall on the eastern and northeastern parts of the country, but below normal rainfall over the western and southwestern parts of the country. Um, those lower than normal rainfall uh, forecasts will put additional pressure on water resources, especially in areas such as the Eastern Cape, where they are, are experiencing uh, water issues and where their reservoirs are already overburdened. Um, and the above uh, normal pre precipitation in other parts of the country can cause increases in those extreme weather um, events that I spoke about earlier, like floods. Um, these climate forecasts also show above normal temperatures that are going to be expected in our spring, our early summer, as well as our late summer periods. And so knowing what to expect can definitely help us to plan better um, for the future. The Department of Water and Sanitation also has really great information and resources that is available uh, to the public. The information I've taken here is from the National Integrated Water Information Systems Dashboard. And you can see the status of the country's dams over the last hydrological year and currently, and how these levels compare to um, high and very low levels. So you can see currently um, the dam levels are higher than that time last year and fall within a normal to moderately high percentage storage. Um, and what's nice here is that as a user, you can um, choose different status overviews. Uh, you can look at drought status, runoff status, dam status, uh, groundwater and drought status, and um, how this affects various uh, settlements um, across the country as well as per province. So you can keep track of dam levels in your province to assist you in adjusting your water use um, accordingly <clears throat> and to prevent placing excess stress on the water supply. <clears throat> Randwater regularly updates the dam, dam status and total storage capacity of the dams in the integrated Ball River system, which is the area from where we um, abstract our water. And uh, these updates are available on all our social media accounts and on our website. And uh, just to inform people of where we stand um, in terms of our dam status. I put this in here as well because I know there's been um, a lot of talk about water restrictions where uh, the municipalities are sitting in terms of water restrictions and uh, Joburg Water specifically um, was on the 27th of August, I uh, sent out this notification that level one water restrictions are still in place. So that's something that we all need to be aware of. Um, if you're uncertain, you can go onto their website and their social media and gives a bit of a background as to what um, level one uh, water restrictions entail. Um, quickly going through the inter interventions that Rand Water implements. Um, we uh, have a lot of our education campaigns. You can see some of the pictures of the communities we work with, the activities that we, that we offer. Um, WaterWise specifically was established in 1997 and we are Randwater's environmental brand. We were initially established to address the, the serious drought events that were occurring in the mid 90s. Um, we work very closely with the general public, with uh, municipalities, selected communities, as well as with the green industry, which is um, the sports turf managers, garden centers, uh, landscapers and people like that. Um, with our research, we are currently working closely with UNISA. Um, we assist them with their postgraduate research as well. Um, but then we also have our water conservation and water demand management um, uh, department. And they've uh, initiated a project that I'm sure you're all aware of called Project 1600 uh, for the integrated Ball River system. And this was established about four years ago um, to guide and support the progress that's made by uh, municipalities to reduce their water demand. 
so that Randwater itself can comply with the license abstraction limit that's um, imposed on us by the DWS. Um, uh, we've got an innovations department. Um, they've got a, a project to look at satellite leak detection. Um, that's going to offer a very cost-effective and automated solution to detect leaks on all our um, potable water infrastructure, our pipelines. And this AI uses, um, sorry, this technology uses AI and algorithms to capture the entire groundwater pipeline network. And that's over 3,500 kilometers of pipeline and that can be captured in, in one day. We're also looking at uh, employing drone technology uh, to create georeference survey maps. Um, and that is to assist us with planning new pipelines, but we also want to implement this in uh, doing our invasive alien plant surveys. Um, so what can you do? Uh, I think um, it's very important while we're looking at it from a holistic viewpoint, um, from municipalities, from reducing water demand, non-revenue water and that sort of thing, to remember that it always comes down to the individual. And it's important that um, we ourselves look at how we use water and how we implement ways to reduce our water demand. Um, the new normal and something that we must all accept is that water will become more expensive. Um, maybe if we're looking at increasing tariffs or we're looking at those unconventional and alternative water sources to supplement our conventional um, current resources, which are, is going to increase our water costs. Um, and we can expect that everyone, except with those without access to pipe water, will use, must use less water for the same activities. And we must pay for our water and sanitation services. So in the poll at the very beginning, I asked everyone how much water they think the average person uses in our country. And a while back, there was a little bit of a controversial statement made that South Africans use uh, on average 235 liters per person per day. And if you compare that to the average of the rest of the world, you can see we're not doing so great. Um, so I think it was mentioned um, in the previous presentations, the great work that Cape Town did when they were uh, facing the uh, day zero scare. Um, and they were implementing the 50 liters uh, per person per day of water. And I want you to imagine um, having that as a situation where it's, it's become the new normal and it's not something that we, we only do when we're in the face of a crisis. Um, it's something to consider. It's not a great situation, but um, it provides us a little bit of perspective. If we, if we look at the 60 million people living in the country, and you times that by 50 liters a day, that's 3 billion liters of water a day at that little amount per person. And it's a very simplified way of looking at things. I know that, but it does put uh, into perspective the, the power of the individual and how much difference the individual can make when it takes to um, when it comes to conserving water and reducing your demand. So that takes me to the end of my presentation. Um, thank you very much. And yeah, just keep in mind that we can only save water while there is water to save. Thank you. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you for that uh, for that presentation. Um, you can you can unshare your screen there. Thank you very much. I think if you can um, if you can stay around, Samantha, then um, and uh, for the panel session, and then we'll sort of uh, we'll we'll uh, would like to sort of ask you a few a few questions. Um, if we can move on sort of to the to the next uh, presenter for this afternoon, so we don't really need to introduce him. So it's, uh, it's going to be Ronnie McKenzie. So most of you know Ronnie, um, just a few, a few bullets sort of, to, sort of to introduce him. I mean, he's got a, a B, BSc and a PhD from Strathclyde in the UK. Uh, and I think most people know Ronnie because he's, you know, he's one, of, one of the people that sort of spearheaded uh, water conservation and water demand management in South Africa. And, uh, and Ronnie is quite passionate about, about water conservation, as, as you will see now in his, in his presentation. Uh, Ronnie is also quite passionate about meteorites. So if you, if you ever have a chance sort of just to sit down with Ronnie and have a discussion, I'm sure the sort of the topic of meteorites will come up there. 
but but this afternoon it's going to be sort of on uh, on uh, water water conservation and uh, using logging results um, to identify where there are potential problems in the system. So Ronnie, thank you, thank you very much, uh, and over over to you. Um, just just before I kick off there, um, I just want to thank uh, Samantha for that uh, very interesting presentation with all the facts and figures that she presented. Um, I just want her to, um, if she can probably chat to Peter Flower at some point regarding the what Cape Town achieved with their per capita consumption. Um, there's a bit of confusion with the numbers. The 50 litres per person per day is what the people actually achieved after the consumer meter. So it was actually what the person was using. The 235 or even the 185 number that she was talking about, that's a different per capita consumption, which includes all the losses plus industry plus whatever, whatever. So um, I think the comparative number that Cape Town managed to achieve, and Peter can correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was about 115 litres per person per day that Cape Town managed to get down to. And that is comparable to Australia during their day zero. They managed to get down to 140. So Cape Town came down quite a bit lower than even Australia managed to achieve, but not quite down to 50 if you take all the losses and everything into account. So those per capita figures, um, you just have to um, be careful which ones you use there. Um, Cape Town wasn't quite that good. They were good, but they weren't that good. Um, okay, so. Talking about using night flows, um, I'm going to just take you through a few slides here and uh, we're going to finish off the day with a bit of luck. So let's see if we can get this working. Um, the first slide, I just want you to have a quick look at this slide. This is a logging result for flow into an area. And uh, I don't know whether we, oh yeah, we can do a poll. That's good. Okay, I want you to look at that logging result. And I want you to tell me whether or not you think we have a leakage problem. So have a look at that three-day log. Oh. Um, oh yeah, three-day logging result, and um, you can tell me whether you think we have a leakage problem or not. And um, I'm going to. I'll get. I'll give you. A, I, I see we have a lot of problems with some people unable to use the polls and such like. So. Um, I'm going to just let it sit here for 10 or 20 seconds while people get a chance to sort of decide whether they think there's a leakage problem. The second question, by the way, um, that is at the end of the presentation. <laughs> so so uh, don't worry about that one. It's, uh, we're just looking at the first, the first one at the moment. I'm only going to look at the answers to the first one. And... Uh, I want to know how many people think we have a leakage problem from that one. And uh, it looks actually as though uh, it's 80-20 it's at the moment. We're up to 48, 50, yes, no. Um, so just have a quick look at that one and we'll see whether we have a leakage problem or not. Okay. I don't. I, I want to give everyone a chance to to do the poll because some people have been really upset that they cut the polls off before they got a chance to answer the question. So um, I think it's sort of homing in about it's about 80, 20, 80 percent off. You think we have a leakage problem. So we'll have a look at that again towards the end if we get a chance and um, I'll kick on to the next slide. If we can do that, let's see, we're on this now. Okay, what is leakage? Now, we've been talking a lot about leakage and we've been uh, we've had uh, people from the IWA, et cetera, et cetera, in here. For those of you that uh, haven't attended our IWA presentations before, I always cover the basics fairly quickly at the beginning. And the IWA, 
introduced a standard methodology to analyzing leakage in municipal supply systems back in the 1990s, when the UK water industry first privatized. And they decided that to try and help the water utilities, they would come up with a standard approach, which they called the BABE approach, which stands for burst and background leakage estimates. And the, it's not rocket science, it's not even complicated, it's actually ridiculously simple. Um, they decided that if you're analyzing leakage in a municipal system, it's important to consider it as burst leakage, which are the large leaks, and background leakage, which are the small leaks. Now, burst leaks, you are able to find them, even if they don't come to the surface, you can find them with leak detection equipment. So leak detection equipment is designed to find burst leaks, which are not coming to the surface. Background leakage, on the other hand, is the sum of all the small leaks in the system. And you will always have background leakage. There may be hundreds, thousands, or millions of small, tiny leaks in a large water supply system. Now, while individually those leaks may be insignificant on their own, when you add them together, they can often be greater than the burst leakage. So background leakage, although each individual leak is very small, just purely by the number that you may have in a system, it can be a significant loss to the water utility. Now, in order to reduce background leakage, you cannot go in and look for it and find it. Number one, the equipment is not sensitive enough to find such small leaks. And number two, even if you were to find those leaks, it would be far from cost effective to dig up the road to find a tiny little leak. So background leakage, the way you deal with background leakage is you either replace the network, which is your worst case scenario, and the option of that is your last option to consider. The other option is pressure management. You don't eliminate the leaks, but you manage the leakage through the leaks. So pressure management is, is the intervention that you would implement if you're looking for background leakage and leak detection, et cetera, and pressure management together would, would deal with burst leakage. Now in South Africa, mainly because we have the free basic water allowance and because we have a lot of um, uh, government properties uh, uh, that have been built over the years, we also have a large issue with household leakage, particularly in the middle and lower income areas. Um, where people struggle to pay for their water and you have a high incidence of, of no, non-payment for water. We often find that there is high internal plumbing leakage, particularly in RDP housing, where low quality fittings have been brought in from various parts of the world that are unable to cope with South Africa's high water pressure. So, We've got three types of leaks that we have to deal with in South Africa, and each of them requires a different approach. And the BABE methodology developed by the UK water industry is simply a, tech, a methodology to deal with these three different types of leakage. Now there's a picture of uh, some background leakage. It's a tiny little leak on a tiny pipe, not worth looking for, not worth fixing, not worth doing anything. This is burst leakage, it's a mains burst, and burst leakage would typically, a mains burst would typically run at five cubic meters an hour. Um, it can go up as high as a thousand or two thousand even, depending on how big your pipe is. But on average, a mains leak would run at about five cubes an hour. A connection leak, it's burst, it's burst leakage, but it's on the connection. A typical connection leak will run about one cubic meter an hour 
up to about one and a half cubic meters per hour, depending on how badly the pipe is broken. And that is roughly a tap left open um, at 50 meters of pressure uh, to a normal household. So uh, a background, uh, a connection burst, typically one to one and a half cubic meters per hour. Now on the BEEB methodology, you've seen this slide before. You've got the logging and analysis of night flows. You've got uh, um, managing your network and uh, fix, uh, fixing the, the various pipes, et cetera. You've got the economics of active leakage control. That's going in and looking for leaks and deciding how often you need to go in and look for them. And you've got pressure management, which we've discussed uh, during this um, last couple of days in detail. I'm just going to touch on this one for the time being to finish off today. And these are the four BABE models. Um, Jay had a different slide. Um, they were a bit more healthy looking than Jay's one. Sorry, Bambas. Um, and uh, this, um, this is our four former chairman and current chairman of the IWA Water Loss Group. Um, and uh, it's Ken Brothers on the top, Tim Waldron on the bottom, Bambos on the left, and Stuart on the right. So those are our four uh, chairmen, chairpersons. Uh, the BABE models are available. Jay's mentioned them. Sandflow, Benchleak, Pressmac, and Econoleak. I'm not going to go into them in any detail. It's late in the day. I will touch on Sandflow, however. The Sandflow model... Is simple, it's a very simple model. Um, it's quite a nice model, I think, in that it comes with a nice user guide that explains the whole BABE methodology. And if you want to get into leakage management and you're not really sure where to start, it's quite a nice manual to read and just give you a bit of insight into what's going on. And after that, you can then go on to the PressMac manual and if you really want, you can go on to the benchmarking manual. And if you've really got nothing to do and life is terrible, then you can read the EconoLeak manual, which is the one that most people don't want to read. Um, it's really quite dry. And oh, if you're struggling to sleep, that's the one to pick up, I would say. Um, but anyway, on the night flow one, what we're doing is we're trying, we use the babe methodology to analyze minimum night flow. And the minimum night flow is the lowest flow going into a discrete zone, which is typically between, let's say, two o'clock in the morning and four o'clock in the morning. And you can see on this diagram, there's a, a broken red line here. There's a seven day logging result. We've got a broken red line that indicates the minimum night flow. Now, below that, we've got three components. And the components are the expected use, which is your normal expected water use. And that is generally people, most of it is people using a toilet to flush at night. Obviously, if you've got irrigation going on, that's, that messes up the whole calculation. So you would typically try to do this analysis when there is no nighttime irrigation, you know, maybe during a period where you've got lots of rainfall or a period in winter where people are not irrigating. Irrigation will mess it up, unfortunately. So you're looking for areas where irrigation is not an issue. And your normal night use is defined by how many people use the toilet in one hour. And the UK, have the, they spy on everyone there. They've got cameras everywhere, so they know when people go to the toilet and they can check it out. Um, they've based it on, uh, in the UK, it might not be the same in South Africa. In the UK, it's generally 6% of the population would flush the toilet in any one hour. And the average toilet flushes 10 litres. So you can make a rough estimate of what the toilet use would be in that hour of minimum night flow. And it would be the population times 6% times 10 litres. 
you've then got exceptional night use. You've got maybe it's an area, maybe it's a residential area, but you've got um, some, you've maybe got a couple of all night service stations where people go in and fill up with petrol and they go and flush a toilet there. You might say we've got 10 service stations and they're each using, we allow 50 liters an hour. So that would be another 500 liters during your night flow. So you make an estimate of what that would be. And then you might have a large factory or a company that's using water at night and you've checked their meter and they would be using one cubic meter per hour. So you add those together and that gives you an idea of your expected water use that is legitimate in that area. So that's the first thing you do. The second one is you calculate the background losses. Now, the background losses, as I've just said, represent the losses that you cannot escape. And that's broken into three parts as well. You've got the losses from mains, and that is typically 20 litres per kilometre per hour. Uh, you've then got the, the losses per connection, and that would typically be three litres per connection per hour. And then you've got, they call it here installation, but it's actually properties. Uh, we normally work on about one litre per household per hour. And that, you add that up, you add those three up, and you've now got your background leakage, and you've got your, your expected legitimate night use, and you add the two together, and the missing part of this addition is then your unexplained burst leakage. And that is what you're trying to identify and decide whether it's big or small. Is the burst leakage a large part of the balance or is it a small part? If it's a small part, then you don't worry about that zone. You go and look at another zone. If it's a big part, then you know that you've got a lot of burst leakage in the area and you use the minimum night flow as an indicator to identify those areas which have a night flow problem. And then you can go and look for the leakage and you've got an indication of how much you're looking for. Uh, this is a simplified night flow analysis. It's actually the same three days that we started at the top. There's your minimum night flow. We use the burst and background estimate, sand flow, to calculate what we expect it to be. And then the difference between the purple line and the green line is now your unexplained burst leakage. And that is what analyzing a night flow is all about. It's not rocket science, it's just basic assumptions. And if you don't know the numbers, if you don't know what the mains leakage is, the IWA give you theoretical values that you can use, and they won't normally be too far off the mark. And it will give you an indication when you do an analysis of a night flow, you'll very quickly figure out if you've got a problem or not. And it will give you an indication of how big a problem. Sometimes the expected night flow is higher than your minimum night flow. If that's the case, then you haven't got a problem and you've probably overestimated some of the leakage factors. But that's those areas you're not worried about. This is a logging result. Um, this is a one, two, three, it's a seven day logging result. Do we have a leakage problem? There's your minimum night flow. What we do if you don't want to do the full BABE analysis, which most people don't want to do because they don't know the number of connections or they don't know the houses or they don't know something or other, um, what you can do is a general thumb suck. And it has been mentioned a few times by various speakers, although not in any detail. You take the average daily demand and you divide the minimum night flow by that average daily demand, and you get a ratio, which we call the night flow ratio, okay? It's a very quick and easy calculation. It won't always work, but it works most of the time. 
And in this particular case, your ratio is 0.28. I always used to use percentages until I got told off by someone at the IWA. But anyway, we used 0.28. I now call it a ratio rather than a percentage. And generally, if it's below 0.2, 20%, I like percentages. If it's below 0.2, you've got no problem. You've, you must have much worse areas to deal with than that. If it's above 0.2, then technically you do have a leakage problem. And many of the areas we deal with, particularly in South Africa, 0.28 is, is really good. I mean, the ones that some of the ones we get are pretty horrible. Here's one here, this is one of the horrible ones. If we do the same calculation here, you take the minimum night flow, the average daily demand, you divide them. We're up at 0.83. Now, that graph that Bambos showed at the very end of his presentation had a profile that was very similar to this. And this is typical of areas with astronomical leakage that have typically been on intermittent supply at some point or simply just never had any maintenance done to them. So if you're up at 0.8, then you don't need to do an you don't need to do a babe analysis to tell that you've got a major problem here. And this is quite a nice example. Uh, we use loggers. There's all lots of loggers. We use some outside, some are weatherproof and elephant proof. Um, some of them uh, some, some of the older loggers that were used, this is one in the Kruger Park, this is not one of ours actually, um, you, we, we don't use um, cheetahs or, is it a le sorry, a leopard, we don't use leopards to protect our solar panels, we don't use solar panels, ours are of an internal battery, but if you've got a solar panel, just get a leopard to sit next to it and no one will steal it, um, it's as good as the snakes that Neil was using in his um, PRV chambers to stop people stealing pilots. A leopard's a bit more aggressive though, I would think. Um, we log the loggers using a reed switch. So you connect onto the meter, sorry. The logger is connected onto the meter using reed switches. Um, remember if your logger's inaccurate, your logging result will be inaccurate. And um, this is a picture of a combination meter, which is two dials. Our experience, and just for what it's worth, you can take it or leave it if you want. Um, we prefer using single element, single jet, single element meters, particularly the, the new high, high accuracy ones, rather than using the dual headed uh, combination meter, which is a much wider range but in our experience, we often find that one or other of the meter heads is not working or the changeover valve inside is not working. You've got three things on this meter that can go wrong. And generally there's one of them giving you some trouble at some point. So a single element uh, high accuracy meter would be our preference. Uh, I think you'll have less downtime with it and it gives, it's just easier to log. Uh, these are some of the, this is an installation. We put uh, these heavy metal things over them to protect the logger, to stop people stealing them. You'll have seen these all over the place. Um, we've been doing this now for quite a while. And uh, I, th I think we designed that with a gentleman in Johannesburg. Um, so they're, they're, they're all over the place now. Um, how much water do you lose through a leak? Um, this leak here, just to give you an indication, this is a mains leak. It was running at 20 cubes an hour for three hours, so it lost 60 cubes of water. This is a bigger mains leak. It was running at 40 cubes an hour for six hours, so it lost 240 cubes. This is a really huge leak. This is for Samantha um, from Rand Water. I thought I'd just make you feel at home here. This is a Rand water leak up near Furtrecher Ruchter, uh, which blew a gasket or something. The whole pipe blew up and it threw water way up into the air. High pressure. When Rand water have a leak, it's a 
it's a sight to behold. And um, but on the positive, it only ran for three hours. Well done, Samantha. That was good. It only ran. It only lost about 600 cubes of water. So even although it was really impressive and probably in the news and everything, it lost 600 cubes of water. This one, this is a little insignificant one. It's a connection leak. Um, however, it ran for three months and it lost 2,200. So it lost almost four times as much as Samantha's big grand water leak there. So it's not the size of the leak. It's how long you let it run that is important. This leak here, this was a very small leak, but we reckon it ran for about three years and it ran up 13,000 cubes of water. So try and get, think of leaks in terms of how much you're losing and then try and put a number to it. If you, if you want to use a number for the value, 20 rand a cubic meter is probably a reasonably good number. Rand water charge about the municipalities, they charge about 12 rand a cubic meter, I think at the moment, but some of the municipalities are charging 70 rand a cubic meter to their industrial consumers and about 20 rand a cubic meter to their domestic. So water, water is not cheap in South Africa, in most areas. Um, quick point here, before you, um, dash out and buy a satellite to find all your leaks and such like, I would highly recommend that municipalities fix the ones they know about first. That is your cheapest option. Do not, do not start looking for leaks and getting people in to find leaks for you when you've got leaks that are bubbling out the ground all over the place that everybody knows about and you're not fixing them in six months. Um, I like the Drakenstein presentation. It's like, we aim to fix it in an hour or less. I've never heard of anyone in the world that's able to do that except Drakenstein. Even Cape Town aims for 48 hours and most other municipalities you probably make that weeks. So anyway, don't, look, don't spend money looking for leaks until you fix all the ones that you know about. Okay, that's a message. Data acquisition. We use these loggers for all sorts of stuff, measuring water, water quality, depth, all sorts of things like that. I'm not going to go into it in detail. Most of the loggers nowadays are um, remote loggers. They don't require power. They're self-powered. They've got a five-year battery life or similar. Um, some of them the one we use, uh, uh, we are using GPRS devices that go onto an internet, a, 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 a cloud-based system. We also use Sigfox, LoRa, RF, etc. Um, so basically, we can tack it. We can tap into just about any device going, pull it into a cloud-based system, and we use that to pick up leaks and send out alarms and all sorts of stuff. Couple of interesting logging results. This is an office complex. Um, I know that because it's, it's, uh, our office is in it and uh, it's definitely an office complex. Um, this was it uh, quite recently. This is what we want to see. It looks good. You can see that it's five days on and then two days off. We don't like working weekends. That's good. Um, you don't want to work weekends. Um, you can see that there's, we take holidays. If there's a public holiday on week three, we all take it. We don't come in. That's also good. So that's the sort of logging result that you want to see in an office complex. What's quite important is that you're, you've got your minimum night flow there. Even in an office, you can use the minimum night flow, not at a big area with thousands of connections. You can use it for a single property or you can use it for an office complex. This is an example. I mean, I've shown you some big leaks. I'm showing you the other type of leak now. Imagine you're an office complex and you're, you're paying a water bill to someone and this you've got a toilet that goes sticks all the time. This is an example of some toilet sticking. Um, ironically, and this is, this is a true story. 
um, I wouldn't lie. Um, ironically, this our company, we tried to set an example of how to save water. So we bought some of the most expensive dual flush toilet systems that you could get. And we put them into our toilets to show everybody that we, we practice what we preach. Unfortunately, they're European and they don't seem to like the quality of the water. It seems to have a bit of silt in it where we are and it keeps sticking. And the valves, these really fancy valves, um, and uh, they just keep sticking. And our toilets, people leaving at night, they don't, they weren't checking to see if the toilet was, and we'd only pick it up in the morning when we get our alarm system. So that's, those are toilet system leaks. Um, this one is, this is getting a bit similar. You can see here that uh, you've got your, this is a six week logging result and there's a leak that's growing. Leaks tend to grow, not always, but often. And this is a really nice example of a leak that is growing nicely. It's just, it's your perfect leak. It's, it's doing everything that leaks should do. Um, not all leaks do this So We've had leaks that are just stable for months on end. Um, so you can see the leak starts here and it gets repaired here and there's your leakage. Very obvious, there's no problem. Uh, that's the toilet sticking again, we'll forget about that. Um, this was the, off, this was us logging our office when we first started. We decided we'll, we'll do what we preach, we'll put a logger in, we'll log our office, see what's going on. We were horrified to find out that we'd had leakage running at about 80% for years in our office complex. And you can see here, that was the leakage. The mission, it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't huge. It was like 700, no, 400, 300 liters an hour. Doesn't sound like a lot, but if, you, if you're running it uh, for the, all the time, when we fixed that leakage, we, we fixed a couple of small repairs, we found them and eventually we got down to zero minimum night flow, virtually zero. Um, over a 10 week period, we reduced the office consumption for the five office blocks, which is about 150 people between the different blocks. We reduced it by 80% just in our office park. And we didn't know we had a problem and nobody, actually bothered to figure out how much water we were using per person. And it's maybe worth your while, if you've got an office complex and you want to know how much water you should be using, just take the number of people in the office complex, allow them three toilet flushes a day, which is 30 liters. So if you've got 100 people, multiply it by 30 and you'll get three cubic meters of water. And that is what you should use per day. That's a good indication. You'll probably find it's a bit less, um, but it depends how much coffee you drink. So anyway, um, normal weekdays, normal week demands. Okay, so obvious. This is a leak at an industrial site. You can see again, the, you've got your, the leak develops. This is a bigger leak. It's about one and a half cubic meters an hour, which is like a tap running fully open. It was fixed, however, in about 10 days. You can see it ran for about 10 days at 1.6 cubes an hour. And there's your Monday to Friday, and you've got your Saturday and Sunday periods. So it, you can see what's going, it's, it's really obvious. That leak, I've given you a dollar price there, don't worry about that. It's a, this was a leak that was running for three years in Johannesburg, or Ikurulene, in fact in an industrial site that had a toilet and a kitchen. And it was running, interestingly enough, at 25 cubic meters an hour for about three years. And then it got, we, we put a logger in, um, thought we had the wrong, thought we were logging the wrong meter, that we were, something was wrong or we'd, we were a factor of 10 out or 100 out. And it turned out it was running at 25 cubes an hour. That was a leak, so it looked like it was in a plastic pipe. Uh, this is another one, this is a nice one. This is an evaporative unit, uh, one of these uh, commercial 
evaporative cooling units where you have a big pan of water and you've got a stop valve on it and you blow air over it to evaporate the water and that creates cool air that you pump into a shopping center or something like that. Very few people know how much water an evaporative cooling unit should be using and many of them are leaking. So it's always a good, good to go and have a look at if you've got any evaporative coolers out there, go and check them carefully. And this one, a faulty ball valve uh, was replaced for about 20 rand, plus time, of course, in finding it. Um, and it reduced, oops, let's go back. It reduced, it went from 54 cubes a day down to 18 cubes a day. So we took off two thirds of the water consumption. And you can see there's still some leakage at the end there that we could still chase down. We're not, we weren't sure what that was, but we, we, we managed to get the big, the big saving. Okay, this is the last one. This is, this is one of uh, water going into an area where at uh, night time, the demand at night time is going up. This is, um, this is um, instead of a minimum night flow, we've got a minimum day flow in this user. And the reason for this is that the leakage has got to such an extent in this premises that the only thing constraining the leakage is the size of the pipe into the premises. So it's running at about 50 cubes an hour. Had we put a bigger pipe in, it would probably be running at 100 cubes an hour. It would, the, the pipe diameter was constraining the leak and it's the very first time I've ever seen a minimum day flow. So we had to change our whole theory about that one. Um, there's your consumption and that's what it looked like. A minimum day flow. So that's really unusual. And we're getting to the end now. Uh, this is intermittent supply. This is a logging result on intermittent supply. Just to touch on this one, um, you can see there's your, you've cut the water off for a certain time. When you turn the water on, you immediately get a refilling spike, which is not good for the system. And it's also not good for the water meter. It can damage the water meter. In this case, we did manage to keep the water on for a couple of days continuously, just so that we could carry out a minimum night flow assessment. And you can see that our minimum night flow is astronomical. And if you use that ratio that I mentioned to you earlier, you're up at about 0.8 again. So it's intermittent supply will invariably end up with astronomical leakage, as Bambos has said. There is just no case for it under any circumstances. So we're back to this one. Did we have a leakage problem? 80% of you said yes, 80% of you were correct. We had a minimum night flow of 80, average daily demand of 150, our ratio was 0.53. I said 0.2 is reasonable, and there we go. 83% of you got that one right. So we've got a very highly educated audience here, which is wonderful. And let's see where we are. Oh, sorry, let's get the mouse working again. Okay, we're finished. That's it. That's the that's the logging analysis done. That is the that's the end of all our official presentations. Thank you, Ronnie. Thank you for that uh, for that presentation. Um, I think we've got a we've got a few we've got a few questions here sort of coming up. So I just want to see if we uh, so I see so Bumbos and Peter uh, Zubair. Okay, so we've got a few speakers here because we've got a, a sort of a mixed sort of a mixed bag of, of questions. Um, I know Samantha is uh, is sort of is about sort of, sort of to she needs to uh, attend a, a meeting. So if I can maybe start with Samantha, um, and then if if uh, if I can get sort of to the sort of to the other presenters. So um, Samantha, if if uh, I just want to check, you are are you still with us? Um, yes. Okay. There is Samantha. So uh, my, the question is. Um, you, you showed some slides, but in, in this presentation, you, you know, it was not your the sort of the key focus, but the, the, the 
awareness and education initiatives that Rand Ward is doing. Is it in, in your experience, what, what is the most effective or the most cost effective means do you think sort of to do um, um, sort of awareness um, and education you know, for, for consumers on the importance of water conservation? Is it, do you care to maybe share some thoughts on in your experience, what, what do you think has, has worked best that, that you would recommend other, other municipalities also do? Hi, Neil. Yes, um, thank you so much for that question. Um, we, it's tricky for us. We have a tiny team. Um, there's only two permanent staff members, um, and then we've got some graduates that assist us. So in terms of what we're able to achieve, what we've noticed is um, social media is uh, probably the most effective uh, in terms of um, human resources and um, and budget and uh, yeah, cost. So uh, it's taken a while for Randwater to uh, get on that uh, bandwagon, but we've um, started working a lot on our social media campaigns. And um, yeah, just in terms of time, um, bodies on the ground, um, cost uh, budget wise, social media has been the best way that we've managed to get our message out to our target audience. And, and how do you uh, how do you gauge it? Is it just maybe the response that you've been getting then back, you know, from uh, on on social media, where you where you where you notice that people are sort of are picking up on on the message? Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. So we look at um, I don't know what they they call those figures. I know there's a term for the figures that you the analytics. I think it is that you can generate off your social media presence. Um, so we have a, a look at the analytics. We look at our website and how many people that's drawing in. We've got a website, so a, a newsletter. So we look at the subscribers on that. So in that sense, we can gauge um, how, how people are engaging with our content. Um, but then also, like you say, it's the responses we get from people. Okay. Okay. No okay. thanks. And then Samantha, maybe a, a, a last question from you, and it's 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 maybe more sort of a rant water question. So I don't know if, if you are not able to answer it, we can we can we can pass it, uh, you know, sort of to someone else. But I mean, if are you are you able to comment on um, where rant water is with the uh, you know with um, what is that project called? Is it Project 1600, where you, 1600. Where you sort of limit, or you or you would like to limit sort of the sort of the demand of the you know of, of your of your consumers? Mm. Uh, I, I think last time I've heard is it that it was already over that that limit. But I don't know. Are you able to give us an update of of mm. where is Rand uh, Rand Water with that, and is it? Uh, sort of what's the what's the what's the next step? You know, is it is it is it, is it imminent that 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 you know some consumers are going to you know be uh, sort of you know where the valves are going to start to be reduced or something? Or if you can just maybe yeah. just give an update of what's what's happening with that? Yeah, um, we are still over the limit. I can't tell you by how much. I, I don't have that information with me. Uh, we are. We have some issues with the municipalities. I'm not sure if you're aware of what's happening with city of Tswani. Um, there are some back and forth between um, the municipality and Randwater uh, concerning some issues with water supply in that area. Um, and it's, yeah, it's coming down to the fact that we've got pressure from the Department of Water and Sanitation to keep our abstraction levels um, to the limit that they've imposed, which we aren't doing at the moment, uh, and then balancing the needs of the, the municipalities and their customers. So it is a, it's a difficult balance. Um, we do have a quarterly forum with the IVRS Project um, 1600. So if you're interested in attending or if anybody here is interested in attending, um, I would encourage that you're welcome to contact me for the details. And there we've got the DWS representatives and municipalities, and that's where we exchange um, information and data. So uh, that's pretty much what I can tell you at this stage. Okay, no, good. Samantha, yeah. thank you, thank you very much for your for your presentation of this afternoon. I, I realize you have to you have to sort of duck out sort of to a, to another to another meeting there. So we'll yeah. we'll excuse you, but but thank, thank you. you very much for your for your time this afternoon. I'll try my best to pop in a bit later as soon as I'm done. But thank you for the opportunity and thanks for having me.
Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Right. Um, so I'm going to jump around now. So we've had it's it's a it's a question that came in quite a bit earlier to Peter. Uh, Peter, I just want to check if you are if you are still if you are still with us. Ah, there's Peter. Okay, that's good. So there was a there was a, a question from um, Nathaniel Padiachi, and he is basically asking. Uh, sort of, so he's saying in in KwaZulu Natal, they also went you know through through a drought, and they seem to you know also be making sort of good good progress during that period. But uh, but uh, but the sustainability sort of after getting sort of the drought, um, he, he's saying that in in KwaZulu Natal they were not quite able to to sustain you know those those uh, efficiencies. Uh, sort of made made during the drought. So he was looking at your presentation, and it and it looks like Cape Town uh, was able to, to to a large extent uh, keep some of those uh, uh, efficiencies. Um, would you care to maybe uh, share some thoughts on that? On on why do you think what was Cape Town able to you know to 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 almost sort of prolong those those. Um, efficiencies and what what advice can you maybe can you maybe give sort of uh, to to municipalities? All right, sure, Neil. Um, I think what it is is that <clears throat> obviously there was a huge amount of communication that took place during the drought, <clears throat> and I think what the city has tried to do is keep the awareness up. Um, Cape Town is still talking about water; it's still a discussion I hear on talk shows, uh, on the radio stations. But the city in its, in its water demand management uh, section has got an ongoing education program and an awareness. So it's still out there talking to people. And of course, they built a lot of the things that were introduced as restriction measures <clears throat> were built into the bylaws um, to be continued as general water savings mechanism. Um, and of course, people invested a lot of money during the drought in various grey water systems at home. And to this day, I know, and I certainly still do it strangely enough, I stand in a basin, uh, a tray, if you like, when I shower, and I collect that water and I still use it for flushing the toilet. Now, I talk to people and those sorts of habits seem to have prevailed. It was a, a life-changing experience for most people in Cape Town. So these things don't die off easily. But I think the main key is to keep a sustained awareness campaign going um, and not just to let it fall away. Good. Um, thanks. thanks for that, Peter. Yeah, I, mean, I, I can recall sort of visiting my, my family there in Cape Town and sort of they, they've got a borehole that's outside, that's not, that's not linked. So, uh, so it had to it, it so we had to walk outside, sort of collect some buckets of water, sort of walk back in, sort of to the house. So, okay. So, in, in the case of Cape Town, your your view is that those those habits learned during during the drought, that's that people are are carrying are carrying on with that. Um, uh, absolutely, I think the whole relationship with water changed, and um, this is a relationship that tends to to stay. And of course, the kids that were growing through that era, it'll. It will be marked indelibly in their minds for many, many years to be water conscious. Mm -hmm. um, Peter, then while well, I'm at you, maybe sort of a, a linked uh, question to that, and it was from uh, Bettina. So she's asking that if, if you if you have consumers that are now moving over to alternative water sources, so rainwater tanks, you know, maybe in the in the case of Cape Town, sort of to to groundwater. Um, how that how that sort of uh, affects the the revenue you know of the of the of the municipality and and how was that sort of uh, uh, taken into account when uh, when new uh, tariffs are determined? Well, it has added a complexity, obviously, and um, the whole tariff structuring has been re you know looked at again uh, to take this into account. One of the things that became apparent to us was that. There were a number of places that were virtually going off the, the water grid um, in terms of taking water through their potable meter, but yet the, obviously they would still be discharging down the, the sewer. And our sewer tariffs are based on a proportion of the water consumption up to a capped amount per month. 
So we were starting to lose revenue from the sewage side while still having to, to accept that, uh, that wastewater coming down the line. Well, that is another thing that is having to be addressed at the moment. But yes, it is a challenge to, to rematch your tariffs to the changed um, profile of, of consumption. Great, okay. Peter, thank you very much, and thanks again for your for your presentation from from earlier today. Thank you for your for your participation. Oh, enjoyed it. Um, the the next sort of uh, two questions, um, Zubair, can I just check if you if you are still uh, with us, um, Zubair? Neil, can I just jump in and answer okay. one question please. that came up? Please, please, Peter. Sorry, if he's not available just at the moment. Um, I think it was from the previous speaker before Ronnie. Um, she was talking about the per capita consumption figures. Yes. The, the graphs that I was showing were all gross per capita consumptions based on the total consumption divided by population. Where we were talking about 50 liters, 87 liters, 100 liters per person per day, those were personal targets. And we decided during our campaign that to tell a household that they must use 10.5 kiloliters a month doesn't really give them much indication of how much water they use. So we converted that to an average household of four people. In fact, the average households in Cape Town is less than four, but we worked it on a basis of four and, try and converted that into a personal target. And we said to people, don't just think because you go to work, now you can use that any, any amount there and only use your personal amount at home. It has to be whatever you use throughout the day. So it became a competition and we had an app available where people could calculate the usage through the day and people were taking this very seriously and monitoring their use. Now those are personal targets that we set in accordance with the level of restriction at that point. Good, uh, th thank you, Peter, for that clarification. So, so what you are saying is the, the, the 50 liters per person per day, that was on the on the customer side after after it's gone through the the customer meter yeah. uh, but if you were to use the, the total input volume uh, into the system and divide that by the number of consumers uh, then you sort of you know get a get a sort of higher number because you then yeah. sort of take the, the losses into the system and also large industrial consumers then then push that number up yeah the the, the per capita gross per capita consumption at the start of the the drought was somewhere around 200, over just over 200. And by the time we got to the, the lowest point of consumption, uh, around about the 500, 550 megaliter a day, we were probably down, as Ronnie said, to about 112, 115 liters per person per day. It's, it's gone back up. I think it's currently sitting at about 140 odd right now. Good, okay. Thank you, thank you, Peter, for that for that uh, clarification. Um, can I check, um, Zubair? Can you just can you just indicate if you if you are around or otherwise? Oh, there is Zubair. Okay, good. You still you still with us? Um, <laughs> yes. Zubair, if I can if I can ask you, thanks for your for your presentation earlier. Thanks for 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 sharing us. Uh, you know, with us, what, what you're doing in Drakenstein. I, I can maybe just mention to the delegates that I, I, I did not, um, I did not ask you sort of to sort of um, to sort of to thank me for any involvement there. So that was that was just sort of from your side, just before I, I get any emails that I've maybe sort of planted <laughs> in your in your presentation. Um, Zuber, you've, you've raised a point there in your um, in your presentation that you you know you tried a certain technology in that case I think it was smart metering, and uh, and it and it you know you you installed uh, you know a pilot and then after the pilot you know you decided in that case you're not going ahead with that so that I was quite interested sort of you know to uh, first of all just the the principle of trying something in on a on a small pilot scale. And then making a decision whether you want to roll it out, you know, sort of to to the rest of the municipality. Uh, I, you know, we, we know of, of of cases where where municipalities have maybe started off going, you know, on on a large scale with with, with certain uh, technologies, and then maybe later on realize that it's 
you know, it's, it's, there are challenges. So can you, can you give us a bit more insight? How does it work in Drakenstein if you guys decide to use certain new technologies? Is it, is that the standard methodology in Drakenstein where you, you, you give certain technologies a try on a small scale and then you test it and then, and then you roll it out on a larger scale. Can you, can you share with us maybe how does it work in Drakenstein when you decide, you know, what, what technologies or equipment, et cetera, you're going you're gonna to use? Yeah, okay. Uh, to answer that question, yes. Uh, for this specific uh, project, um, our, our challenges were, um, it was relatively um, new, not new to the market, but um, new to um, our cost recovery um, strategies. Um, we had to first uh, establish whether the available te technology is reliable uh, before putting it out uh, on a large scale. It was earmarked actually for a project in, in Sarum for um, council earmarked about 3 million rand to implement it on a large scale in Sarum. Uh, because we're sitting with an uh, issue there where uh, we have a large uh, number of indigenous consumers using a lot of water. Um, so we first implemented on a small scale as we do with anything else before we implement it. Uh, we like to be certain that uh, the technology or the uh, proposed um, method of reducing non-revenue water um, is suitable and working. So the, the challenge that we picked up with the, the prepaid metering was number one, the below ground meters were rated IP68, but we found some product failures. Uh, we then uh, checked what solutions they are to that and decided to go with our above ground meters. I know in Johannesburg, there is, it's quite uh, popular, the above ground, the ground meters. Uh, we've also tested two different manufacturers. So we don't go with a single um, single make. We, we like to test which uh, which uh, technology provides us with the best results and also ease of access. Um, there's a number of things that we take into consideration before implementing a project, like socioeconomic impacts, uh, performance of the products, failure rates, and whether it is, whether we have the actual capacity to manage uh, the newly implemented infrastructure. Um, in this case, for the prepaid meters, we didn't. Um, it requires 24 seven, um, hands on a uh, 24 seven hands on approach. Um, we've, we've received up to 60% failure rates uh, during the rainy seasons. And from there, I made the recommendation uh, to my line manager to say that this isn't going to be uh, a viable option for us um, with, um, yes, it does. After doing, actually after doing a uh, survey with the consumers, they were actually happy with uh, the, the, the prepaid meters uh, or smart meters. Uh, because then they can monitor their consumption uh, patterns and things like that. But the failure rate of the technology is just um, was too large to, to to implement it on a on a bigger scale. Um, yeah, I hope that that uh, answers part of your question, uh, Neil. Okay, no thanks, thanks, Zubair. Um Also, there was a there was a question um, after your presentation about one of the delegates asking. Um, how do you how do you deal with, with theft and vandalism, uh, especially of water meters? So can you maybe elaborate a bit? You know uh, um, what Drakenstein does on 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 the theft of water meters. Any ideas or deterrents that you have? And if you can maybe, I, I think you mentioned it, but I'm not sure if every of all delegates sort of picked it up on on what you do inside your PRV chambers to deter people from getting in there. So maybe in, in general, anything that Drakenstein does to, to, to safeguard your sort of your equipment, any any advice or thoughts you have on that? Yeah. So as I've mentioned, the equipment that we put in is quite pricey and it needs to be uh, tamper-proof or, or made as more as, as tamper-proof as possible. Um, so what we do is in our PRV chambers or all of our chambers, uh, that there's access uh, for, for, for personnel is we have um, paper gas systems installed uh, at the rack set, paper gas systems uh, and alarms. Uh, we also uh, make sure that our areas are fenced off to prevent access, uh, unauthorized access. Um, another thing that has been incorporated uh, into our chambers and uh, all of our accessible chambers is um, the use of smart locking uh, cover and frames where 
um, it's, it's durable. Um, it has the option of this um, of uh, in configuring a magnetic key uh, where you can check remotely who gained access when and which time. Um, so that's working uh, pretty well. So we're we'll restricting access to uh, PRV chambers and uh, other chambers we wouldn't like anyone to gain access to. Um, coming to the uh, the water water meter thefts um, as part of our bylaws. Um, the meter must be installed one meter by one meter inside each property. Um, we also make this the responsibility of the, uh, the pilot also indicates that it's the responsibility of the consumer to protect the water meter. We have seen a recent surge in um, the, the, the stealing of water meters, uh, mainly because um, it, mainly in the lower um, and informal uh, income areas, um, lower income and informal areas, um, the, they target mostly the brass uh, fittings and water meters. Um, the value that they get out of it is little to nothing. But um, in these um, economic times, people are getting desperate. We're seeing a larger increase in theft of water meters. Um, but to, in the end, the consumer has the responsibility of protecting his water meter, and um, they will have to pay for the replacement deal. So that is one of the um, steps that Drakenstein has taken to um, prevent or, or um, the theft of the water meters is to um, hold accountability towards the consumer. Um, and yeah. Good. Okay, Zubair, and while you while you've got the mic there, there's a, there's another question that's come that's come in now uh, for you from from Jade. So so he's looking at those at those those really those stainless steel pipes that you've got there in installation, and he's sort of asking the question: um, Have you also opted uh, galvanized um, steel pipes? Um, he's saying in the. Uh, in Cape Town and specifically the district I work in, uh, we prefer the use of cement lined and sheathed uh, steel pipes as appropriate uh, cathodic protection. Uh, this is found to minimize the effects of corrosion and, and pitting. So, so he's basically he's, he's asking about um, alternative options, you know, other than the, the stainless steel pipes being used by, by Drakenstein, you know. Uh, um, have you considered other options or do you maybe, uh, I know it's been like that for a number of years, but you know, do you, you know if Drakenstein considered other options and, and how did you decide that it's, it's worthwhile to, you know, to go with stainless steel uh, uh, pipes? Um, we can provide various examples where um, our stainless steel fittings haven't failed us. Uh, it is the more expensive option, even our nuts and bolts. Um, are all stainless steel 316. Um, we have uh, over the years, uh, the various uh, um, uh, materials have been considered. And for us, the stainless steel works. It's, it's proven itself over time. Uh, I can, uh, if, if you would like, I can take my contact details and we can give, uh, we can send through uh, a comparison between um, how the stainless steel fittings look uh, compared to um, the galvanized or alternative materials that have been used. So as a standard, uh, it is something that we've that I myself uh, have adopted upon joining the water services team here by Drakenstein, uh, my manager and mentor, Mr. Kowaleski. Um, he tries to uh, keep us up to date uh, and upskilled with the latest uh, advances in materials and things like that. So at the moment, our main product is uh, for uh, basically if we're connecting to anything other than HTPE, stainless steel, and from there, uh, we use our adapters to, to connect up to the existing pipelines. But I hear you on the, the galvanized and the cement lining. It's just that it hasn't been uh, as effective for us as the stainless steel. So, uh, yeah. Okay. The bear, thank you very much. And thanks again for your, for your presentation this afternoon. And it's, yeah, it's, I think there was, a, there was a comment that came in from one of the delegates that, it's, that it's, it's nice to see that there are still, you know, some of the sort of smaller, medium-sized municipalities that's, that's doing really well on, on water loss reduction. So I think, you know, we can, we can sort of compliment you and the Drakenstein team on what you are achieving there. And thank you again for the, for the presentation you made. No problem, Neil. Thanks for the opportunity and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Um,
can I check? There was actually a question on one of the topics that Bumbles raised. Or can I just check with Bumbles if he's maybe still still with us? Uh, Hello, today. Yes. Zubair, yeah. can you unmute yourself? Or mute yourself, sorry. Uh, Bumbles, can I check if you are still with us? Oh, there is Bumbles. Good. Okay, excellent. Um, Bumbles, if you can, there was a question that came in earlier uh, on, on one of the points. Um, and it was regards to the, to the additional costs that, that consumers have to incur if the system moves on to intermittent supply. So, so the specific question was on, I think you mentioned, um, you, may, you made reference to a, a suction pump and, and the question from Anton was if it's not maybe a booster pump. So I don't know, that's maybe a bit sort of technical because it just depends on where you get the, you know, how the water is abstracted. But if you care to maybe uh, just repeat or elaborate um, all the possible, you know, additional costs and, and effects on, on the consumer side that 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 uh, that intermittent supply may uh, may have an have an impact on. Fine. Yeah. Uh, so for, from my experience, um, the you know there are a number of ways of actually the the consumers uh, deal with intermittent water supply. Uh, normally, if they have space uh, in in their sort of ground area they have so-called ground tanks. Uh, maybe what they will do in an intermediate water supply situation, they, they will add maybe one or two more tanks in order to be able to get as much water as possible. However, in order to mimic 24 seven, in other words, to have available water in their household, then they have a kind of a a uh, small pump uh, uh, sucking water from their ground tank, sending it to the um, roof tank or to the elevated tank. And from there by gravity, it goes into the household. Now that's one way of doing it. Now, the, the other way, if there isn't uh, sufficient space available um, around the building, and we do tend to get this where we have terrace houses, one next to the other, and it's not easy to have a ground tank. So I've come across a situation where, and I've shown in one of the photographs, immediately after the water meter, the consumer puts a suction pump. So as soon as the water comes, they turn on the suction pump and water is sucked out of the pipe and pump up to the roof tank directly. Uh, so that's another way of doing it. And that's where I refer to the um, term suction pump. In other words, there is no ground tank. And booster pump, that is where there is a ground tank and the water is taken from the ground tank and pushed up to the elevated tank. So th these are the two main types of, of uh, storage uh, that I have come across. Now, in terms of ground tank, they're either sisters. I, for instance, my experience in uh, Hebron uh, city in the West Bank, you know, I've come across some houses that the, the entire basement, it's a system and, and they collect water, not only water coming from the utility, but also they, they, they are, uh, uh, roof drain pipes, they drain into these tanks. So they're, they're huge, they're maybe 20 cubic meters uh, or even more, and they store water because really uh, water is a scarce uh, resource in that part of the world. So uh, in other areas, I've seen that they add one, two, maybe three tanks, uh, plastic tanks in their backyard, they collect water and then uh, they, they, they pump water as needed uh, to uh, the roof tank. So the, the, the uh, consumers really find ways 
of uh, overcoming this crisis. Uh, obviously, they spend a lot of costs, both capital costs and operating costs. Uh, so um, that is something that uh, really um, it, it's kind of transferred from the utility to the uh, consumers, customers in a situation where we have IWS. Over to you, Neil. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Bambos. Yeah, so that's an interesting example, that one in, 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 in Yebron that you mentioned. So they, they basically have a, uh, almost have a, a basement storage there and any, any water that comes from any direction gets, gets put into that storage yeah. tank and then there's obviously a pump that extracts it from, from that, from that uh, tank. In fact, Neil, that is, uh, from my experience, uh, that is the worst uh, a um, case that I have come across in terms of water availability and supply. Um, it, it average out over the 365 days in a year that they get 24 hours every 18 days. So if you average out the, you know, the, the, the actual time that there is water available for the people there, Every 18 days, they have, one, they have one whole day. Now, they may get it in drips and drops, but that's what it works out. And, and that's, you know, so far, that, that's the, the worst, uh, if you like, case that I have come across with Terminator. So if, if you think of that, that they only get water on average 24 hours every uh, 18 days, they must have you know, huge storage areas. Mm. in order to store as much water as possible uh, uh, from the supply system when it's supplied from any other source they also buy from water tankers and and they they mm. fill up their tanks but but bumbles i mean if it if it takes that long for the water to get through the the system i mean is, do they have uh, significant water quality issues then because i mean it's, it's they do i mean that water is not drinkable it's just for any other use in the house and it's heavily chlorinated. They just throw chlorine, you know, in, in their systems. But the the uh, the 24 hours over 18 days, that's averaging. It it may work out that you know they they may have six hours, you know, uh, once a week, you know, in one week, and maybe 10 hours the uh, the following week. So on the whole, I've added all these hours up. And, and I divide, you know, I worked out how many days and I divide the 365 days by the total number of hours in terms of days that water is supplied. I, I just wanted to get a feel for it because it, it's not regular, say every day, two hours, maybe six hours one week, maybe 10 hours another week. So you don't, you know, they don't know, but yes, not only this case, I think each and every case of intermittent water supply, there is an issue of water you know, quality. I mean, in, in, in uh, my own utility, when we had intermittent water supply, although we went into intermittency, having a very good system operationally, we did have quality issues. Uh, and we, we, we tried at least uh, to, to avoid um, any uh, sort of uh, growth of bacteria. How do we how did we do that with uh, additional uh, chlorination? But again, that created other issues. Uh, it created other problems in terms of, of smell, um, in in, uh, in terms uh, of, of uh, sort of uh, heavily chlorinated water, uh, which basically you know, when, when mixed, you know, with suspended uh, matter in the water could potentially create other uh, dangerous situations. So it, it's, uh, even in the best of cases and, and systems, I think water quality deteriorates. Um, so uh, I, I, it's, it's really a, a, an issue that, you know, um, needs
needs to be seriously considered before one moves down that route, uh, together with all the other uh, issues that you know we, we mentioned earlier. Good. Okay. No, thanks, Bambos. If I can ask you one more question, so um, uh, you know, on uh, off from the IWS um, topic and on onto uh, background loss estimates. So I'll, I'll ask Ronnie the same um, question when we when I get to Ronnie now. But uh, um, the question is that um, uh, much of the background loss estimates are based uh, on experiences in other countries. And, and do we have data from South Africa? So I'll, I'll ask Ronnie the same question, but Bambos, in, in your experience, have you, um, in, in the countries where you've worked at, how, um, what has your experience been with those um, standard uh, background loss estimates? And was it, uh, you know, was it uh, more accurate in some countries than, than others? Or, or did you find that those um, uh, those estimates, you know, gave you generally uh, uh, sort of a, a reasonable um, answer? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Emil, for this question. I, I I will respond by saying that I have been fortunate enough to, to work in countries and utilities that uh, really um, we have um, very little data to go on. Uh, and uh, not enough information in order to be able to do uh, top class uh, textbook calculations. Now, why I'm saying I, I have been fortunate enough because through this, uh, I was able to learn a lot more uh, and, and see how best to apply what it was developed within the, the water law specialist group of the IWA. So in answering your question, no, I haven't come across a situation where we could uh, know with a certain degree of accuracy what the background losses were. Usually the systems uh, that you know, I, I come across and, and I worked and I carried out studies um, are, are systems that you know uh, are, are not in good operational order. So, what we have applied as a starting point is uh, um, what we have assumed uh, in uh, the uh, water law specialist group uh, in case that we don't have any actual and and, and reliable information. Uh, to go on to be a good starting point. We needed to make a start and then we improved the quality of data and information as we moved forward. Uh, and, and that is uh, been my experience, at least in the countries that I have been working um, uh, so far. So um, I, I can't say that I, um, uh, I have come across uh, more reliable information than what we have come up um, to start with at the uh, uh, water loss uh, specialist group. It was, for me, it's always a good starting point if I don't have um, reliable and audited data. And then starting from there, I improve that according to each case and as more data become available, uh, validated, reviewed, and, and we move forward uh, in, in this manner. Thanks, Neil. Thank you, Bambos, for that for that clarification. So if I understand you correctly, is it, it, it in in most of the of the projects that you've done, you are if 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 you do not have other information, you are you are also using those, those standard um, sort of um, estimate figures that the that the IWA has been sort of has been using. Or yes, that is, that is that is for me. It's a good starting point, and I use my professional judgment, uh, depending on what the situation is, to perhaps adjust them accordingly, uh, check my, my my results, and then move forward in order to be able. Uh, to uh, get better data 
for me also, when I do a top-down analysis, applying 95% confidence limits, that's another way of actually checking whether I, I have uh, results which I can rely on and, and make um, uh, reasonable plans for NRW reduction. Uh, so the, the error margins that one gets when it uses the 95% confidence limits, then that kind of uh, gives you an indication uh, uh, how, how close you are to, to the actual situation and whether you need to improve the data accuracy and the data quality before you do uh, uh, something else, before you come up with your strategy to actually reduce uh, your NRW. So I, it, 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 as I said, I've been fortunate enough to work in situations where you know, uh, the, the, the data has not been great and we had to improve the data and, and, and work on that and uh, make, make decisions as we go along. So yes, in answer to your question, I, I, I do use uh, as a sort of first approximation, uh, most of the values that we have come up uh, at the water loss uh, uh, specialist group, uh, and then improve uh, as, as we go along and learn more about the system and, and, and have more uh, reliable data. Good. Thank you, Bambos, uh, for, your, for, the, for that feedback. And thank you again for your well, presentation. If I may add one more thing. Please. Uh, just, I know Ronnie mentioned in his presentation that for uh, legitimate night use, he's gone back to the way uh, in the UK they use for toilet flushes, 6% of the uh, population times 10 liters which 10 liters used to be the old cistern uh, uh, sort of um, capacity. Fine, well, we, in, uh, in the uh, water loss specialist group, when we come up with this and we produce the, the, uh, the DMA uh, guidance notes uh, document, there we, we, uh, we use some other figures, which again, they are approximate, but more or less, can be used uh, if other information is not available. For instance, we use um, one, there's a range of, of low, uh, medium, and high values uh, in terms of the legitimate night use at the minimum night flow per household. So there we use the actual number of registered customers rather than the population. Registered customers, it's a number that more or less every utility knows with some degree of accuracy. And that number that is used varies between 1.2 to 2.4 liters per household per hour. So that's another way of actually coming up you know, with the legitimate night use. Um, and, and uh, just to say to the participants that you and I had a discussion a few days back, and we compare the two methods, the one that Ronnie mentioned uh, and the one I've mentioned now, and more or less the, 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 the outcome is the same. So again, it shows that uh, these approximations do work. And I think Ronnie did mention this in, in his presentation. If information is not available, then this provides a good first approximation uh, for, for this particular calculation. Sorry for taking uh, too long. No. Thank you, Bambos. Thank you for that, for that information. Thank you. And thank you again for your presentation for you know, earlier, earlier today. So we, we appreciate your time. And uh, I know you've got a you've got a trip sort of coming up next week, sort of uh, al almost into our part of the world. So uh, good luck with your trip, and I hope we can we can touch base soon. Thank you, thank you very much, Neil. Thanks very much, you know, for inviting me to be part of the summit. Many thanks. Thank you. Uh,
Um, Ronnie, if I can I check, I suppose you are also still still around. If if would you would you maybe care just while we then on that topic of of background um, estimates, uh, would you care to share if 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 you're aware of anyone in South Africa has done any checks, you know, to see whether those estimates are realistic or, or any other similar sort of uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, country. So would you, you know, maybe elaborate a bit more on, on, on the background um, estimates? I mean, I, I think, um, thank you, Neil. I think Bambos has covered it pretty much. Um, I know that there have been a couple of um, uh, university academics that have sort of gone out to try and um, re-establish what the UK water industry came up with years and years ago. And they have come up with perhaps new numbers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I don't really get too worried about it because it is a very thumb suck approach. And if you're using it in practice rather than as an academic assessment, you're trying to establish whether or not you've got a leakage problem. And if you use the base values from the UK water industry, you'll very quickly see if you've got a leakage problem just by using the base values. Um, I think that the, to, to put it in perspective, when we analyze um, analyzed uh, Seba King for our big pressure management installation in Seba King, we had a minimum night flow of 3000 cubic meters per hour. The assessed normal night use ranged, if you used, if you used the basic uh, parameters from the UK, uh, the, the normal night use that we expected was 200. And if we kind of jippoed the numbers a bit and used much higher numbers and went to extremes, we got up to about 400. So the unexplained losses that we were looking at there were 2,600 cubic meters per hour out of a total of 3,000. I wasn't really worried after that, whether I was using the UK values or what, um, uh, I think it's Professor Fonsale from uh, Cape Town University had come up with. Um, I think he's come up with some numbers perhaps. It, it really, it, it's a bit of a moot issue. Um, the, the idea is, I mean, to be honest, if you just use that night flow ratio, you'll probably get a very good indication of whether you've got a leakage problem or not. Um, it, it, you won't, if, if you have to guess if it's really tight and you're not sure, the chances are that you've got areas with much worse problems than the one you're looking at, which you can go and deal with. So. I'm not too worried about the fact that the numbers were developed in the UK, mainly because South Africa, although in many regards it is still developing, it's maybe counted as a developing country, as far as the water supply systems in most of the major cities and urban areas, it is operating on full developed country standards. It is not, if you, if you look at Cape Town, Johannesburg, Schwani, Ikuruleni, their water supply systems are running at high pressure. They're running at world-class standards. I mean, what Bambas was talking about, when you go to India and you go to Thailand and you've been yourself, Neil, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's night and day compared to what South Africa's got. So unless South Africa totally throws the baby out with the bathwater on its water management, we've got very good systems that can still be salvaged. And that, that non-revenue water number can be turned around. Um, it, I mean, India, I would guess their non-revenue water is averaging between 80 and 90%. So we've got a long way to go before we're there. We're definitely heading in that direction, but I think uh, speak, listening to Jay and 
the government, you know, people from the government, they are, they do seem to be saying the right things and taking it seriously. And there are, there's definitely pockets of excellence throughout the country that can be used here in South Africa to make sure we don't end up in those situations. Um, I mean, a nice example uh, was a conference in India, which I, I was presenting something, and there was a paper on effluent reuse from a hospital. And I thought, oh, this is really relevant to South Africa. I'll go and listen to that. And the gentleman that was giving the paper mentioned that there's all this effluent coming out of the hospital and they are using it to grow vegetables in this big field, huge field with lots of people all walking up and down planting things. And I asked them, I said, well, how, how do you, how do you treat the water? And he looked at me and goes, no, we don't treat it. We just take it from the hospital and we flood it onto the fields. And I said, you that's a bit, that's a bit risky, isn't it? And he goes, oh, we, you know, we have problems. You know, there's a, you know, hepatitis is a big one. And um, he goes, the, the guys have to be really careful because they're in bare feet in these fields planting stuff. He says the syringe needles, they've got to be really careful with these syringe. They're just, they were just taking water from the hospital and flooding a field with it and growing vegetables. So it's, we're not anywhere near there. Um, so I think South Africa has got a lot to be thankful for um, in that regard. So anyway, that's Good. just one of the stories. I'll stop there, Neil. I think you're running out okay. of time here. Thanks, thanks, Ronnie. Maybe you can just end this end this off. Um, um, Adrian Wilson is asking a sort of a, a tongue in the cheek uh, sort of um, oh, yeah. a cheek question there, and maybe maybe it's a paper a paper you know for for the next one. And he's asking yeah. if. Uh, if if you are finding if, if leopards or, you know are, are more uh, are more successful than cobras as a, as a deterrent, so yeah, maybe thank you, Adrian. Thoughts. Thank you. If, if if you can also then maybe Ronnie over to you if you if you are able to maybe um, then you know uh, um, sort of close um, the conference and I think give give over to Tom once once you are done. Okay. No. Thank you. Thanks, Adrian. Thanks for attending our conference and thanks to actually everyone that's. Uh, stuck it out. Uh, we're down to 130 now. We were up at 180 um, most of the time. So thank you to everyone and thank you for participating in the questions. Uh, Adrian, you're regarding your question whether we would prefer cheetahs or cobras to... Um, it depends. I mean, it's horses for courses. Um, it depends if it's a small installation, then probably a cobra would be more appropriate. And if I've got a bit more room, then a cheetah would work well, um, I think. So anyway, thank you for that question. And thanks for all the questions you've given to all the speakers. I uh, see you've been very active there. Um, I just want to thank all the speakers, uh, Peter Flower, Zubir, Unati, uh, Bambo, Stuart, everyone, I think uh, you've put in a lot of effort and uh, you've put in nice presentations and I think we've had pretty positive feedback from everyone. And uh, hopefully we will carry on with our series of um, conferences. We hope that the next one will be a live one face to face and we will hopefully come down to Cape Town and have it there. I believe that the Lord Charles Hotel, which has hosted us for so many years is no longer in existence. I think it's been, I'm not sure what's going on there. So we'll probably move to Century City again, uh, or one of the other super venues down in the Cape. And you can all come down to the Cape and um, we can start living again. Um, so from my side, uh, thank you everyone for sticking out to the bitter end. We're 10 minutes ahead of schedule, I think. But anyway, I'm sure no one's going to complain. And I would like to pass over to Tom now to close off the event and um, uh, finish us. Uh, Tom from SICE, thank you for your help in organizing this event and doing all the hard work in the background there. Uh, from me to everyone, goodbye. And hopefully we'll see you next year. Hope you enjoyed it. Bye for now.
No, thank you, Ronnie, and, and your team. Um, from SASE Academy's perspective and SASE itself, uh, thank you to the IWA Water Loss Group for entrusting us with the event. I hope we have done you and all your water loss specialists proud. Uh, it's been our pleasure to host you and to ensure that the event runs smoothly. We apologize for the odd technical problem along the way, but such is the nature of technology. Uh, often user error more so than technology itself, but I think we managed to get through it. Uh, I'd like to obviously add my thanks to all the presenters. If I can break them into three different groups and firstly start off by our new young emerging water loss specialists, let's call them. Unati and Ivy from yesterday afternoon, wonderful to see the enthusiasm of youth and in particular for your jobs. Uh, keep up the good work and hopefully your example can be an, uh, a, a lesson for all the others that are in the session. And then today, Zubar and Samantha, uh, thank you very much to the two of you as well. It's nice to see there is a new generation of water loss specialists emerging under the guidance of some of the other uh, more gray-haired and older looking gentlemen. And then I had a dilemma as to where do I stick Neil? If I put him in the younger group, he may take offense because I know he is mentoring some of those young speakers. If I stick him in the same group as Jay Stewart, Peter and Bambas, he may take offense. And Neil is probably sits in the middle as the middle generation that's taking both the youngsters up into the specialist realm and keeping an eye on the old bullies who are starting to obviously get older and older. And then to those old bullies, Ronnie in particular, Jay Stewart, uh, Peter and Bambos, uh, your contribution is always invaluable. Even when we did the dry run, it was interesting to listen to you. You speak with a great deal of passion. And I think in any of our jobs, the more passionate are you about what you do, this is not really work. We enjoy it. We love it and keep up the good work. Thank you to all of you for your contribution. I know that all the delegates will have gained valuable lessons from all of you. They're probably feeling depressed in some respects, but also quite enlightened and hopeful in others, seeing what can be done. To the SASI support team here at SASI National Office in Tabaleng and Mishka, thank you for doing all the work behind the scenes in terms of getting all of our branding and all of the paperwork done. And to Rafilwe and Ndu from VTV for making sure that the event ran through the Zoom platform without too many any major hassles. Just a few uh, administrative issues. The event has already been validated for 1.5 CPD points with EXA. We are just awaiting for the uh, SAC NASP, which is the PRSI NAT validation number, and also for the SAGI for the GIS people's uh, validation number. And then we will communicate to all of you what those validation numbers and values are, so you can claim your CPD points. Um, as far as the actual presentations are concerned, the VT, uh, VTV team will go through and edit and clean up the various presentations in order for us to stream them. Uh, keep an eye out on SASI social media platforms through SASI TV, and all of the presentations will be made available in YouTube format. There were some requests for contact details of the speakers. You can send me an email. And uh, once I've established that they are not uh, opposed in terms of poppy and all the other legislation these days for me to disclose their contact details, I will certainly do so with pleasure. Rather than you harass all of them, just send the information request to me. And then lastly, as far as the presentations are concerned, yes, they are available in a PDF format, uh, six slides per view, which if you would like a particular presenter's uh, uh, presentation, uh, they are quite large documents. We'll try and reduce size them. Some of them are uh, five, six, seven, eight megabytes. Uh, please email me and between myself and Tabaling and Mishka, we will make those available to you. Uh, on behalf of our partners for the event, obviously the IWA Water Loss Specialist Group in particular, uh, thank you for asking us to help you with this event and I hope it was successful. To WRP and your team, uh, behind the scenes, I've forgotten your lady who has been very uh, helpful in giving us information and chasing people. Please pass our thanks on to her and to Ronnie and Neil in particular. Hopefully from tomorrow you can go back to earning a living for WRP. 
and then to our sister institutions, uh, WISA, IMISA, uh, thank you for marketing this event to your members and uh, for getting them to support the event. Uh, we hope that they have also benefited from it and that a lot of the lessons learned can be taken back into their local authorities. With that, I officially declare the event closed and I trust that you won't have to travel too far to get home if you are sitting in your lounge or wherever you are. Uh, stay safe and hope to talk to you all again in the near future, either through a next summit where we are involved or alternatively in terms of any of your SASE activities. Take care, everybody. And thank you for, for joining us. Bye for now.